At this point, we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I call this meeting to order. Before we, uh, we begin, uh, we have some new town meeting representatives who uh, the town clerk will swear in. So I'm going to turn the mic over to our town clerk, Tricia Zuris. Good evening, everyone. Can I have all of our newly elected town meeting reps please stand? That's great. Okay, if you'll all please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. Do solemnly swear and affirm that I will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent upon me as a town meeting representative according to the bylaws and charter of the town of Chelmsford and the laws of the Commonwealth. Congratulations, you are duly sworn. Before we begin, before we begin, I would like to take a moment of silence for the town meeting reps who have passed away in the past six months. Uh, Finance Committee member and town meeting representative Elian Consalvo, Dennis Reddy, Stephen Zaharoulis, and pa past town meeting representative Edna Edie Coppenhaver. Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, I also uh, would like to introduce our new finance committee members, if they're here. Uh, one of them certainly is. Uh, Eric Chambers and David Gosselin are the new FinCom members. I have reviewed the warrant and state for the record that it has duly and properly been posted and that this is a proper town meeting. At this point, I'd like us all to test our uh, voting d devices so that I may declare a forum. So check the screen, make sure that your, fo your vote is being uh, recognized. At this time, I'd like to announce that the uh, 
The fire exits are located on both sides of the room. There's two on each side and at the rear of the room. And I'd also ask people after they've tested their voting uh, devices to silence their uh, cell phones. I've also been requested to ask that if you have to leave the meeting early, kindly drop off your electronic voting devices with the checkers at the front hall. And we do have a quorum, not surprising, thank you. I would like to welcome all town meeting representatives to tonight's meeting. As been our practice, we have two screens so that all reps may read the articles and any amendments upon which you will be voting. You can also view the slides, uh, the slides on the screen on your iPads, laptops, computers, or other smart devices. Uh, I don't know if they posted the, the instructions on how to do that. Um, can you do that? Thank you. So just log on that way, and you also can log on so you can view this at home if you so choose. Speaking of amendments, all amendments will be submitted on the forms, which you can get either from the town clerk or myself. If you know prior to town meeting that you intend to file an amendment, you can see uh, either me or Patricia Service prior to the meeting for the form, or you can email, uh, email them to me and I will make necessary copies and distribute them to town council and the typist so that they will be ready before town meeting begins. And if you can get them either to, uh, to either of us prior to the introduction of that article, town council should have the opportunity to review the amendment, which will expedite the meeting. This form will, uh, uh, exists of three, uh, an original and three copies. The white copy uh, ret I retain. The yellow copy goes to the amendment assistant, which uh, is generally John Sousa. The pink copy goes to the town clerk and you retain the orange copy for your records. I would like to thank Chumser Telemedia for their assistance in setting up the screen, streaming and timer, and broadcasting uh, this meeting. There are a few rules with respect to town meeting protocol and, and procedure. All questions and debate shall emanate from the microphone facing the moderator in the center of the hall and shall go through the moderator. Board or committee members, other town officials or department heads may use other microphones to answer questions or to provide information to the meeting. Speakers shall refrain from asking rhetorical or argumentative questions and shall only ask questions seeking needed information. The question should be in the who, what, when, where, and why mode. Kindly avoid argumentative questions that st start or end with, isn't it true? Or wouldn't you admit? I would prefer not to have to rule questions out of order, but I'm bound by the laws and regulations that define our conduct, and I will do my best to enforce them fairly and respectfully. I will allow a reasonable amount of follow-up questions, but I will have to intervene if an in individual is asking an excessive number of follow-up questions. All presenters of articles will be limited to 10 minutes, and I shall notify each when they have one minute remaining. With respect to discussions, speakers are encouraged to be brief, and each speaker will be limited to five minutes of debate. You should be able to make your points within five minutes, if you truly believe that this is enough, not enough time, kindly advise me in advance and I may allow some leeway. Speakers should ask their questions prior to engaging in discussion. Making inquiries will not be considered as part of the five, five minute discussion limit unless you have started dis discussion and then ask questions. Once the clock starts, it will not stop until the speaker does or time expires. I would appreciate being advised that a speaker is beginning discussion. We do have some other rules of protocol. Please do not refer to any prior speaker by name. The proper designation is to call him or her the previous speaker. Please refrain from personal attacks. Challenging or arguing in opposition of another's position is fair game and is what this meeting is all about. Intentional slander against any individual or group cannot be tolerated. Let us refrain from repeating arguments that have already been made. 
but new ideas or distinctions are welcome and encouraged. Discussion of pending litigation will not be permitted unless specifically included in the Warren article being debated. If during the course of discussion I observe several speakers on one side of an issue, but none in opposition, I will interrupt debate to inquire if there are any who wish to express an, an opposing position or offer an amendment. If there are none, I shall end debate and move the question. If there is opposition, I will move that party to the front of the line and allow debate to continue. I trust that you will all appreciate how, how this will advance our mutual goal of moving town meeting along. To those who may be next in line, should I ever have to exercise this process, you have my apologies in advance. There will not be any debating from the presenter's podium. They may answer questions, but should they want to engage in debate, presenters will have to queue up in line like everyone else. A person should not speak a second time until everyone has had an opportunity to speak, unless the previous speaker wishes to correct or dispute a statement of fact made by a previous speaker. This privilege will be narrowly construed by the moderator. Transparency and effective governance are the two goals of town meeting, to expedite our meetings without affecting transparency. We have successfully employed a process called consent agenda. A consent agenda allows the representatives to bundle several, several routine Warren articles into one so that instead of taking several separate votes on these essentially bookkeeping articles, we can take one vote on all of them. The town manager and I have discussed the, the type of articles that would be conducive to this process. There are art, these are articles that generally do not involve any question or debate and are passed in the normal course of town business. I shall request a motion that the body vote to approve the consent agenda involving the articles to be included. This still allows for questions and answers and discussion with the opportunity to add or delete consent agenda articles as town meeting deems best. The articles that I am suggesting for a consent agenda are articles 10, 13, 14, 15, 17, and 18. Out of regard for the presenters and your uh, fellow town meeting representatives, I must respectfully request that there be no conversations at your tables. If I can hear background discussions up here, it means that there may be representatives who cannot hear the presentation, question and answers, or discussion. Thank you. So now uh, we can begin with article number one. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and good evening, town meeting representatives. I'm Paul Cohen, town manager. Um, at the beginning of every fall and spring annual town meeting, we have at our, as Article 1, reports of town officers and committees. And the purpose of this article is to basically bring back to you items uh, for consideration that are not on the warrant uh, for this particular town meeting, but, but are, have been acted upon in the past to let you know the status of where things stand. And the one item we have this evening is a follow-up regarding the town meeting appropriation last session regarding the Route 129 branding and marketing. And so we have the Economic Development Commission is going to give a brief update regarding the branding and marketing efforts. And also we're going to introduce you to our, our um, business development director, Lisa Maroney. So at this point, I would invite Eric Salerno to, to the podium. And Lisa, if she's in the hall, if she would come up as well to be recognized by the town meeting. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Eric. Good evening. My name is Eric Salerno. I've been a member of the Economic Development Commission for uh, several years now. Um, and uh, thank you, Mr. Cohen. Uh, I've come up this evening. This will be our first test for a 10-minute time limit. Um, to give you an update on the progress that we've been making on the appropriations that have been uh, provided to the town to develop a marketing strategy and branding for the Route 129 corridor. Um, before I continue, I'd like to mention uh, all of the members because everything uh, that I'm going to mention this evening is only a portion of all the efforts that have been put forth by the EDC. Um, it's also uh, imperative to have input from every member of our committee. That includes Sam Chase, Peter Dulkinos, Michael Kowalik, Laura Smith,
John Wellman and Donald Van Dyne, our chairman. Uh, the subcommittee that we're presenting the information for today um, was uh, presided by Michael Kowalik, myself, and Laura Smith. We are also very fortunate to uh, have most of our meetings attended by um, Lisa Maroney, our new business development officer, Evan Belansky, our community development officer, um, and all the liaisons from either the planning board or the board of selectmen. So thank you for all of your input. The Chelmsford Economic Development Commission um, was tasked with uh, putting out a request for proposal from agencies in order to help us um, direct our marketing and branding efforts and help us come to a consensus uh, and come up with professional results. We received uh, a minimum of, uh, I think it was three or four, or f actually up to five proposals. We accepted three of them for interviews, and we accepted one from an organization called Schneider Associates. We had our kickoff meeting on November 1st in 2017, and we defined our scope of deliverables as the generation of a new name and logo to help identify the section of town that is going, that represents a significant portion of our town's economic engine. Another portion of our project is for a website development to give a digital location for people to go for more information and keep tabs on developments in that area of town. And the third item is more of a media development piece. Um, we felt it was important to have an agency that can assist us with the development of video production. The goals and objectives for the initial part of our project um, was to develop an overarching theme for all of our de deliverables. We wanted to have a consensus and a common theme that uh, could be felt through all portions. We've identified during extensive brainstorming and white uh, board sessions with all of our members, as well as uh, several members of the agency, to define our demographics. We're going to be trying to target the aging millennials that will be moving, hopefully, back to the suburbs from some urban areas. We are trying to define our and encourage business diversity and clusters of business at different um, sites and sizes. And we want to promote the balance of the quality of life that the town of Chelmsford is known for. Employment, culture, schools, and affordable housing. This is a lot of um, topics for us to balance, as, as you can see. We performed a word association exercise um, to help us come to a consensus on what we considered um, Chelmsford to be. And although we only have three terms listed on the slide that you see here, I um, rest assured we had um, several whiteboards completely filled with positive terms that we were trying to weigh out to help direct the efforts that we would be going, um, moving to, through the following months. Some of the adjectives that we all um, came to agreement on obviously are des desirable, a cutting edge uh, perspective, and forward thinking, um, forward thinking development for that section of town. The differentiators for this section are the overlay and zoning flexibility that we provide, our geographic accessibility, and the proactive team approach that Chelmsford brings. Um, I'm particularly proud of the Economic Development Commission's ability to draw collaborative input from different members and different committees within town, including the Director of Business Development, the Community De Development Director, the Board of Selectmen, the Town Manager's Office, as well as all of our members. As you can see here, this is gonna be one of the most noticeable elements that's already been completed for the portion of our project. Um, this is the logo for the Chelmsford Crossroads at Route 129. So this is the unveiling of our logo if you have not participated in any of our um, previous meetings. Um, the reason, the way we came across this, uh, the name for this section of town has to do with the geographic and the philosophic perspective that that business district provides for the town. Considerations that went into the development of this logo include um, specific colors, the aspect ratio, which is essentially the dimensions of the logo, font selections, and specific word placement. The logo uses that we took under consideration include signage, newspaper usage, website, video, and digital use, as well as print collateral. And I'm proud to say that, and very pleased that we have moved beyond the name and logo phase and we're moving into some other sections now. So this section of our project has been completed. We're currently in the process of moving into our website development and video production compo components. 
The Route 129, actually the Chelmsford Crossroads at Route 129 website is going to be a marketing tool that's going to be actively managed to share timely information and encourage users to further engage with the economic development team. I, I believe that moving forward, the Economic Development Committee is going to be an active um, organization that's going to continue to interact with the other members within town in order to promote the economic development opportunities of our town uh, beyond our borders. The website design has been planned to be built on a ubiquitous platform that many of you are probably already familiar with called WordPress. We've selected a theme called Avada, which is also a best of breed solution. It's been installed over 500,000 times worldwide. So we, um, we're trying to future proof the, the technology and the platform that we're building the website on. And we've already gone through some research regarding plugins, maps, uh, lists, and video plugins that allow us to get um, even more leverage out of our digital efforts. Our estimated current completion date for the website is towards the end of July, um, early August. So we're hoping to have that completed um, towards late summer. As I mentioned, the third component for the scope of work that we've defined for the marketing agency to help assist us through is the video production component. Um, as we go through these types of projects, we often find that we need to make some adjustments with regards to the way we're going to deliver this, uh, these components. Um, I'm proud to say that we've also uh, in, engaged with Chelmsford Telemedia, as well as some other talented individuals within town who have volunteered to help assist the Economic Development Committee to produce um, engaging videos that help promote the great quality of life and the business opportunities within Chelmsford. The goals and objectives are going to help to attract, educate, and share our current market-specific information with stakeholders and the broader public. The EDC is taking a perspective to get our message out to not just our neighboring communities and businesses that might be considering to relocate here, but we're encouraging our economic development director as well as the members of our board to seek uh, opportunities beyond our border towns and even beyond the state of Massachusetts. For uh, our video benefits, obviously pictures are going to speak a thousand words. We'll probably be producing around uh, two to three two-minute videos with the perspective of um, generating essentially a library of video that we'll, we'll be able to draw from in the future as we continue to develop digital assets to help promote the town of Chelmsford and the um, Chelmsford Crossroads at 129 sector. The video production was scheduled to be finished slightly after the, video, uh, the website launches at the end of August. Once the website and the videos are done, our, our tasks are not necessarily 100% completed. Our tasks are going to be to continue to meet with stakeholders, including property owners, developers, real estate brokers, businesses, and existing um, prospects. I know our, without stealing too much thunder from Lisa, we've also been working very hard at developing lists of prospects and opportunities for businesses and developers to um, start projects and relocate here within town. The EDC is actively creating partnerships um, with organizations that help us provide relationships with people that help uh, find opportunities for the town. We currently have plans to form or attempt to form a, a 129 association of organizations that have a vested interest in the success of that particular section of town, specifically businesses that are located there as well as residents. <clears throat> We are actively joining and participating in industry-specific associations such as Mass Econ, Mass Development, Middlesex 3 Coalition, and others. The efforts that I, I, I highly compliment um, everybody that's been involved with the efforts and our ongoing commitments to building momentum and interest within 129. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Maroney, and I am the Business Development Director, recently hired to the town of Chelmsford. My background is uh, from the city of Leominster. That's my hometown. And I just finished up about 12 years of economic development in that city, uh, bringing it up to full capacity. I had implemented um, six or seven tax incentive uh, programs. I brought the city into the highest biotech rating achievable and uh, provided technical assistance to all of the business there in a variety of ways. I look forward to doing the same for Chelmsford, working hard um, as part of the team, bringing in new businesses, uh, filling up empty space, providing technical support to the existing business base, and expanding your uh, taxpayer um, 
revenue by bringing in uh, new businesses here. Prior to Lemonster, I worked 12 years at MIT Lincoln Laboratory uh, as a business manager, managing $30 million budget there. Um, I did achieve a uh, bachelor's degree as a night student from Bentley University and moved on and have a master's degree in uh, business administration from Fitchburg State. So thank you very much for uh, bringing me into your community. I am going to be working hard uh, to make a difference here and I appreciate your time and attention tonight. At this time, I'll entertain a, moment, uh, a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda. So uh, I don't know if we have that on the voting thing. Otherwise, we'll just raise our hands. Uh, so all, uh, all in favor of approving the consent agenda of articles 10, 13, 14, 15, 17, and 18, unless there's discussion, and I don't see any, please raise your hands. All those opposed, pass. Thank you very much. John, can you forward me to Article 10? Can you forward me the slide for Article 10? It's uh, yeah. you all set, Paul? Yes, I'm, I'm just waiting for John to get us the slide um, for Article 10, the Sewer Enterprise Fund. It's on page 61 in your, your handout this evening. Can you, can you just do a jump, John, or? Mike, can you, can you jump the presentation to Article 10? Okay, thank, thank you, John. Okay, Article 10 is the Sewer Enterprise Fund. Um, this is the annual appropriation to run the Sewer uh, Division of Public Works uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. As you may be aware, uh, an enterprise fund is a separate accounting and reporting financial mechanism for the operation of the sewer system and that revenues and expenditures are kept distinct from the general operations of the town. And so what that means basically is that all revenues and expenditures, revenues ass assessed and collected on your sewer bills stay with the sewer project and all expenses are covered from the, those dedicated revenues. The good news, as you see at the end of the slide, is that this year the sewer enterpri enterprise budget decreases by over $200,000 or almost 5% for the upcoming fiscal year. And that's because uh, last year we had a capital project in the self-contained fund um, that is not, not included for the upcoming year at that l funding level for capital. And, but the best news of all is that there will not be any increase in sewer rates for the third consecutive fiscal year. Under Article 11 is the next article of the consent agenda. And this has to do with the sewer uh, pump station upgrades and here we're seeking to um, an appropriation of $180,000 from, from the um, Sewer Enterprise Fund free cash to fund the upgrades of the Mulland Avenue and Western Avenue sewer pump stations in the, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll go to 13 as well. 13 is the Peg Access Enterprise Fund. The, here it, the funds, from cable access on your surcharge of your, uh, of your Verizon or Comcast bill go to fund the te Chelmsford Telemedia organization of the community. You can see their budget is just over $700,000 uh, for the fiscal year. And again, their source of revenues is not the tax levy. It's, it's outside of the state aid and, and local receipt formula, again, as an enterprise fund. That comes from the four and a half percent assessment on your Comcast and Verizon bills per the town's cable television licenses uh, that, are, that expire in 2024. Uh, Chelmsford Tele Cable Television Operations, commonly known as Ch Chelmsford Telemedia, will have a, a level operating budget for the upcoming fiscal year. We now go to Article 14 is a small enterprise fund. It's a $30,000 expenditure and revenue account having to deal with the golf course. Uh, the Chelmsford Country Club has been in the town's operations now for over 20 years. Um, we've 
few, I think four years back, we converted to an enterprise fund operation, of which the revenues from the management agreement for the private company to operate the golf course and the clubhouse facility go to support the operations of the, of the golf course. And so again, in fiscal year 14, that amount remains unchanged at $30,000. Um, article 15 is departmental revolving funds. Um, the town, um, at last town meeting, under the provisions of the Massachusetts uh, municipal government reform through Governor Baker and the legislature, uh, adopted the revolving funds into its bylaws of the community. However, under that provision of state law, we are required to vote, revote the annual amount of expenditures under that fund for each of the fiscal year. My thinking is this is probably the legislature's way of keeping the funds, the funds current and in front of the town meeting body um, so they didn't get uh, forgotten. Um, so once again, these amounts are unchanged from the year, so the fees for um, dog pound and licensing, again, support the dog tags and, and revenue that associate with it. Uh, the senior citizens are on trips that operate out of the facility, so if they're going to Connecticut or other locations, the revenue that those travelers pay go to provide for the, those uh, companies that provide those transportation services. Similar, there's a respite care program that's offered by the Council on Aging in this building. And again, those individuals who participate in that program, their funds or expense for that program pay the program costs in its entirety. So again, it's outside of the tax levy, levy and counted for separately. Uh, same thing is when we turn in old police cruisers, the money for the trade in those vehicles go to provide communication equipment and the new vehicles. And fire life safety equipment, same uh, provision with used fire equipment and apparatus. And the last one is a seal of weights and measures. Uh, the inspections that are taken uh, at the gas pumps to verify that you get a gallon of gas when you, when you are filling up, or the uh, scanners in the retail stores, or the scales and so forth. The inspectors that are, that are compensated for doing those inspections come from those uh, establishments that pay those fees. And in fact, that's a regional service provided to the community through the Northern Middlesex Council of Government. So that's the, the, uh, the uh, action under that article. Again, it's an annual renewal. The amounts have unchanged. And then Article 17 is the cemetery improvement. Um, again, revenues from the sale of lots and graves go to pay for the um, ongoing improvements at the uh, cemeteries across the community. Uh, Pine Ridge Cemetery is the active uh, cemetery project that's been going on for a few years. Um, that work continues with the expansion at that facility, and so this article again takes $50,000 from the sales to continue and finalize that expansion project. And then the last one is Article 18 on the consent agenda, the Community Action Program Fund, which as you can see here is a $10,000 appropriation. Uh, this fund has been in existence since 1996 at that spring annual town meeting, and periodically we come back to town meeting to replenish the fund with $10,000 appropriations. Um, again, it's a source of matching funds for projects that benefit the community uh, by providing cash awards to those uh, individuals and organizations that do these civic projects. Uh, to date, there have been over 100 projects, uh, totaling over $100,000, uh, such as the Harmony uh, Adventure Park uh, and Eagle Scout projects and boardwalks and so forth at Roberts Field. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Manager. At this point, does the Finance Committee have a recommendation with respect to those six articles? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Articles 10, 13, 14, 15, 17, and 18. Thank you. Does the Board of Selectmen have a recommendation? Board of Selectmen approves uh, unanimously Articles 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, 17, and Thank you. 18. Now's the time for uh, question and answers or discussions. Does anyone have any questions? Does anyone have any answers? We do have a question. Good evening, town moderator. Um, Chris Bowman, 3 Julio Street, Precinct 4. Um, I just have some questions on Article 15 about the re uh, revolving funds. I understand that they were voted in last year for the various departments. Um, so I would like to ask, how were the revolving funds used last year, if at all? 
and what were they used on, and what happened to any unused funds? Are you referring only to Article 13? Article no, 15. just Article 15. Article 15, 15. thank yeah. you. Through you, Mr. Moderator, yes, although these funds were voted into the town bylaws under the Municipal Government Reform Act of the legislature, we've been operating these revolving funds for well over a decade. In fact, they were in place before I started here over 12 years ago. Um, to answer your question, the, the funds, any fund balances at the end of the fiscal year remain with the fund, and so much like an enterprise fund, they're kept whole and distinct, and, and the the programs um, basically take place with the funds from, from the operations and operating revenue. So uh, it varies over the course of the year um, in terms of senior citizen trips. Again, the, the fund cannot exceed $75,000. I think at the end of the fiscal year, the balance was like $13,000, if memory serves me correct, and then, and then on and on through the process. So although it may have been new to the bylaws last year, this has been the standard operations uh, for the revolving funds at least, I think it's at least 15 years because I know it's a few years, probably even more than that. Um, so yes, the funds do remain with, with the fund. They do not go to the treasury of the town. Okay, okay. Um, were, were they used, okay, so this is part of the regular operating procedure over time. Yes. And just recently became a bylaw. Exactly. Is that, is that correct? Exactly. Okay. Um, so I presume what the reason for it becoming a bylaw is because they're very useful in the various departments because of things that are unseen. Yeah, otherwise the, motion the, was, lot, otherwise the motion was a lot longer in, in years past because it wasn't in the bylaws. And so it really, it, it was a request of the cities and towns to not have to reestablish these funds annually. So they said, well, you can vote them into your bylaws. But then the legislature said, well, if you do that, you still have to authorize the amounts every year. So and, it, it reduces the motion, but has the same effect of right. bringing it to the community every year. Okay. And, and these, um, the values per yes. the various uh, department areas yep. appear to be the same as last year. They're right? exactly the same as last okay. year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? There being none, we shall uh, vote. A yes vote is to approve these uh, Warren articles. No vote is against it, and abstaining means that you are not voting on that. So for those who might not be familiar with uh, the notion of a consent agenda, it is a way to take what would otherwise be fairly ordinary, repetitive article uh, articles on the warrant and 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 uh, allow those to be taken care of in a, a very efficient way. Uh, I might want to mention that one of those articles under this consent agenda. And right the final now, vote is this. unanimous, 144 in favor, no opposition, and no abstentions. The uh, budget Manager. for the Telemedia, so we're all Thank you, happy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The Article two. Budget passed Article two is a request to fund a collective bargaining achievement that's been achieved since the last town meeting. Uh, just slightly over a month ago, uh, an arbitration award was issued by the Massachusetts Joint Labor Management Committee pertaining to a collective bargaining agreement between the Town of Chelmsford and the Chelmsford Firefighters Union Local 1839 International Association of Firefighters. And I'm going to turn the podium over to uh, Assistant Town Manager Michael McCall who um, has been handling the bulk of the labor efforts for the community uh, to explain the uh, content of the award and the funding request. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Manager, Mr. Moderator. What you have before you this evening is a funding article, as the manager alluded to. Uh, we're seeking $358,000 to fund the portion of the arbitration award that covers fiscal years 17 and 18. You'll notice that the money will be coming out of two separate places, out of the Finance Committee Reserve Fund, $178,000, and $180,000 from the Stabilization Fund. Given that this is a one-time expenditure, it would make sense to take money out of such funds. If this was a reoccurring uh, funding effort, we would be looking to take that out of the levy. Where we are with this award is it's been a bit of a process. Some people don't understand what the arbitration award is all about. 
Um, we have multiple collective bargaining units here in the town. And as our cycle goes through, every three years, we sit down with the bargaining units and we negotiate salary increases and other issues of interest to the respective units. Um, as you may know from past town meetings, we resolved all of our other collective bargaining units um, essentially within a framework of a 2% salary increase over the three fiscal years, 17, 18, and 19. We, were, we did not reach agreement right away with the firefighters as well as the police patrol and supervisors. What makes the public safety unions, the firefighters, as well as the police office union unique is that if there is a dispute within the negotiation process, they either side in the party can petition to what is called the JLMC. The JLMC stands for the Joint Labor Management Committee, which is a committee of members appointed by the governor. There's a 12-member committee in Boston. There's six representatives from the management side. I am an alternate to that committee. And then there are three representatives from the fire department and three representatives from the police department. So if a dispute arises and either side reaches out to the committee, what first happens is mediators will come out to the community and try and, and push the matter forward and help resolve the disputes. If that is unsuccessful, the matter can be brought to the, the joint committee and they can be involved with the negotiation process. And ultimately, if it's not resolved, they can take jurisdiction of the matter. As it progresses, each side's allowed to pick up to five issues uh, that they're concerned about in the dispute. And if it still goes unresolved, the committee can vote to send it to arbitration. During the arbitration process, a representative from both the management side and the labor side works with the arbitrator. And if um, things aren't resolved, it goes to a full administrative hearing. In the case of Chelmsford, um, each side was represented by their respective labor council. Um, each side called witnesses, some had experts, and at the end, the arbitrator sits down with the, the other two members uh, from the fire, uh, in this case, the fire side and the management side, and they make a determination. The determination, the, the overview of the full award in our instance was there was a, a two, two, and two salary increase awarded for fiscal years 17, 18, and 19, there was also a 1% increase in the EMT stipend, which became effective um, in fiscal 17. The arbitrator also awarded one firefighter to one apparatus to come, out one of, to come out of one of the stations. And the town also sought to get light duty for any firefighter that was injured on duty and had been out for over 90 days. What is important to note is both sides were looking for um, other issues, as I indicated, each side is allowed to list up the five issues. Um, the union sought a differential in pay um, for certain shifts. They also sought other pro board certifications. The arbitration award did not include those. The town also sought to eliminate vacation while firefighters were out on duty uh, for injury. And they also sought to eliminate certain um, extended vacation on anniversary years. What's important to note is the arbitration award, it's a binding award. Within the statute that creates the JLMC, it's important to note that both sides have to support the decision of the arbitrator. So I'm here this evening to present this and to ask you to fund the, the salaries for the fiscal year 17 and 18 uh, for the total amount of $358,000 for the arbitration award to the Chelmsford firefighters. Any questions? Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The majority of the Finance Committee recommends approval of Article 2. Does the Board of, Board of Selectmen have a recommendation? The Board of Selectmen voted unanimously to support Article 2. Thank you. At this point, does anyone have any questions? Paul Regazio, uh, Precinct 7. Can you speak into the microphone, please? It's hard for me to hear you. Paul Regazio, Precinct 7. Thank the you. 178000 out of the, the uh, finance reserve, what amount is left? I assume that's out of the 400000 that was appropriated last year. So this takes one seventy eight. What is the balance? 
there's another article that will be taking some money from that reserve fund. At the end of the evening, if Article 2 is passed, and the other article, I can't remember, there will be 50,000 left. There's yeah. another article this evening seeking to borrow, I think, 160. Oh, okay. So, 172. Okay, so most of it is used up then. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Kathy Tuberty, Precinct 1. Could I pull the Finance Committee and figure out what their votes were? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I really can't hear. Could I pull the Finance Committee and find Sure. Out? Okay, thank you. It might be the mic, because usually you can hear me. To answer your question, there was one abstention. That's it again. What is Brian my Latina, Precinct 4. Um, question for the speaker, Mr. Moderator. The, the, the number of firefighters that are already EMTs, is that a small number or is it a large number? It seems like a lot of money here. All of them are EMT certified. Um, second question, why don't we roll the EMT benefit here up to 7% into their normal salaries if everyone is already an EMT? It seems that... It's not part of the base salary. It's, it's something that they were awarded over time, a stipend for getting that early on. Now it's a requirement. So it's a requirement to be a firefighter to have an EMT yes. certification? And, and that was not part of the negotiation? To roll it together and if, if it's a requirement? It was not part of this particular negotiation, no. It's just separate. Okay. And a follow-up question, Mr. Moderator. If, was this a surprise to us? I mean, why didn't we put it in our budget? We're, we're taking it out of the finance budget at the end. It's a surprise? It's been going on for a couple of years? No. When, when we started the collective negotiations with all the bargaining units, the framework that we were working within is the 2-2 two, two, and 2, as I indicated. So the portions that we're funding here this evening are the 2-2 two, two, and 2. Um, two fiscal year 17 and 18 in this particular article, fiscal year 19 in Article 6, which will be coming up. But these are the one-time retroactive payments, essentially, for those years past. So it would be appropriate to take those out of the reserve and stabilization, where funding fiscal 19 going forward would be appropriate to take out of the levy in next year's budget. Okay. But we did not plan for that, or did we? We, plan? we did. We put money in the stabilization fund before for this. And Thank you. Thank you. Nancy Arroway, Precinct 1. Mr. Moderator, through you to the speaker. Um, the first bullet uh, on the summary of arbitration award, could you explain it? It's a, a little grammatically quirky, and I'm not really sure what it's telling me. What's the difference between with the arbitration and before the arbitration? What specifically are you looking at? What's changing? Okay. So one of the issues that was brought up in, in the collective bargaining was firefighter safety. And as I'm sure you'll hear later on in Article 6 from the chief, um, firefighters operate under a standard where they have, it's called two in, two out. Um, if there is a situation, presumably a fire, two firefighters will not go into the structure unless there are two firefighters outside to back them up. So the concern that was raised on the part of the fire department was our current model of five stations with two firefighters in each station presented an issue because the first truck arrives, you only have two people, you can't send them away until you have the others. And there's no dispute that that's how we should operate and we recognize that. What the fire department, the firefighters, excuse me, were looking for was to have more men on all the apparatus in, in each of the stations. The arbitrator came down and said, essentially, to start with, I'm going to award one firefighter to one apparatus, on one apparatus in one of the stations. So this adds one head count to the entire fire department at all times? Oh, Technically, okay. no. Ms. Airway, excuse me. We're only talking about the retroactive award in this article. We're, we're going to get to that 
later on, okay? Just so you understand. Any further discussion, questions? Apparently not. Okay, so we're gonna vote on uh, Article two, this requires a two-thirds vote. Again, this is uh, money for the current and prior fiscal years to uh, cover increases awarded to the firefighters through a collective bargaining agreement that was just settled recently. There are other implications for that that will be taken up shortly, involving uh, staffing levels and budgets going forward for fiscal 2019 and beyond. That could take- The article passes 143 in favor, three uh, opposed, and one abstention. That could take a uh, considerable amount of time, as I, I suspect you'll see. Mr. Manager. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Article three are amendments to the current fiscal year's operating budget. Um, as you recall, and as noted in the motion, a year ago on April 24th, when we were in this room, we voted an operating budget that began last July and runs two months from now till June 30th of this fiscal year. And, um, and we made we made some slight adjustments in the fall, and as obviously as events transpired during the course of the fiscal year, um, we, we have to uh, make some slight uh, ad adjustments. And here we're, we're transferring $172,300 from the Finance Committee Reserve Fund to the following budget items. Uh, line item number two, municipal administration expenses. expenses. This is a $20,000 transfer, and this is primarily in the area of legal. Um, we, during the course of this fiscal year, we had a legal transition where we changed town council. So we really had the transaction costs and efforts from going from old council to new, uh, bringing everybody up to speed and ch changing caseloads and so forth. Um, we also had a significant labor arbitration process um, that Mike spoke regarding the firefighters, but we've also been in the arbitration process with our two police unions, the police patrol officers union and the police superior officers or sergeant union of which uh, arbitration uh, process continues uh, and will likely be before you at fall town meeting. Um, and also we had significant legal work regarding the Katrina Road pro uh, uh, project in terms of the trans transaction of the uh, Brownfield site on Katrina Road, which is now under purchase and sale and should close this summer. And then we also had a, extraordinary expenses, some legal, some engineering and so forth with the town's expan uh, ex exploration of the UMass Lowell West Campus. In terms of the future disposition of that site, we formed a special committee, and then we looked at the hazardous materials, um, perimeter boundary, and other I issues of that site. Uh, and so we basically, uh, at, when you do the full accounting, and we asked the town accountant to look at payroll and other expenses in terms of the recurring costs, such as telephone and other utilities and other expenses to the remainder of the fiscal year, we need an additional supplemental appropriation of $20,000 to municipal administration expenses. In the area of public safety, personnel services, it's also a $20,000 transfer. This one is much more straightforward. Unfortunately, during the past year, our animal control officer has been out with a long-term illness, and so obviously we covered him with his accrued benefits, but we also had to bring on board a, another animal control officer to provide response to the community. Uh, in the area of public safety expenditures, we we're over by a slight amount of $10,000, uh, and that really had to do with the reconstruction of the fuel uh, uh, fueling pumps at the police station, which are now the universal fueling pumps for the community, and really just sort of crumbled under the weight of the heavy trucks and fire apparatus, DPW, and other equipment that is now our fuel dispensary at this time. Um, under Article 7 is public works snow and ice removal. Uh, there's a $50,000 overage there. I probably don't need to speak too much of the, the winter that we experience, and, and um, particularly in March, and we believe at this point that it will st have stopped snowing for this fiscal year, and um, we will, we will, $50 will, will bring us out and close that without a deficit uh, to carry forward. Uh, under municipal facilities personnel services, at a nominal amount of $5,300, and that had to do with a personnel transaction. The town's energy manager um, departed to the private sector, and so we had transaction costs in terms of 
paying off his accrued benefits and bringing a new person on board, and the net amount was $5,300. And then the last one, which is more significant, has to do with municipal facilities expenditures for the 28 buildings that the town owns and operates. Uh, and we had some unforeseen uh, expenses uh, late in the fiscal year on that in terms of the town office's roof suffered some leaks and wind shear damage. Um, that was a capital expenditure that we put into the FY20 schedule that we probably, in hindsight, probably sh should not have pushed it off uh, to an additional year to 19. So we did have to do some repairs there. We also did address some repairs at the Roberts Field DPW roof for the garage building that's there. Uh, we had some significant issues in the HVAC system at the police uh, station. And then the last major one was the Harrington School. Um, we had to do a water meter upgrade, uh, again, that wasn't foreseen at the time when we prepared the budget. Uh, so that, Mr. Moderator, is a summary of the request under Article 3. Thank you. Thank you. Does the Board of Selectmen have a recommendation? I mean, sorry, the Finance Committee have a recommendation. The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 3. Thank you. Does the Board of Selectmen have a recommendation? The Board of Selectmen unanimously approves Article 3. This is the opportunity for question and answer or discussion. Beth Logan, Beth, it works. Um, Beth Logan, Precinct Three. Um, I'm always curious this time of year. How is our energy saving doing, and is it helping our budget? The, our big ed energy saving program we did a couple years ago. Oh, yes, that, that is working. In fact, uh, the Public Works Director, Gary Persigetti, gave a presentation at a recent Board of Selectmen with, with Darren, our former energy manager, and we're in the black for, for the second year of that program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? There being none, we will entertain a vote on um, Article 3. This is to... Uh, uh, transfer $172,300 from the Finance Committee Reserve Fund for the six art, uh, items uh, designated. The article passes 145 in favor, one opposed, no abstentions. Article 4. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Article 4 is the fiscal year 2019 budget for the Chelmsford Public Schools. As you can see on the screen, the amount that I'm recommending for appropriation for the Chelmsford Public Schools for the upcoming fiscal year is $59 million. Uh, you may recall a couple of fiscal years ago, um, we decided to segregate the schools, both the Neshoba Tech uh, Regional School Assessment and the Chelmsford Public Schools, separate from the general uh, balance of the general operating budgets of the town. And then we've also decided to alternate which one goes first in terms of the public schools of Chelmsford or Neshoba Tech. So this year, Chelmsford Public Schools goes first. So with that, I'm going to turn the podium over to Dr. Jay Lang, our superintendent of schools who will provide you with an overview of the school's budget. Good evening. A few things for you as we get um, started. On the back table when you came in this evening, uh, there was a copy of our uh, budget, so hopefully you've picked one up. If you haven't, you certainly can uh, grab one uh, during the night or on your way out. Um, what we find helpful, and I won't um, belabor it, the first 20, 25 pages or so of the budget book, uh, talk a little bit about spending in the school department, some historical um, spending charts and figures. Um, there's some discussion about uh, academically how our students are performing. And again, I won't get into um, all of that tonight. But I did just want to hit for a minute because I know a lot of town meeting uh, representatives have an opportunity to watch school committee meetings and hear about some of the progress that our students and schools are making and some don't. Um, so I did just want to touch for a few seconds on a couple of the highlight slides, uh, with, again, without getting into it too deeply, um, just to let you know how well our students are actually performing in the schools. And we very much appreciate uh, your support now and obviously throughout the years. 
Uh, but overall, some of our accomplishments, our uh, English language arts and mathematics scores, our students are outperforming their peers statewide and uh, certainly within our comparable districts, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, Chelmsford finished either, either at uh, the top spot or uh, one of the top spots on our uh, MCAS scores and our next generation MCAS uh, that is taken, which is an absolute phenomenal accomplishment. Um, the the uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education each year ranks districts by what they call their comparable profiles. So they take into consideration um, school profiles, uh, demographics of buildings, number of ELL students, special education students, and they compare you to your 10 closest districts in the state. So these next couple of slides will actually just show you uh, how well Chelmsford students perform. So these, again, are just snapshots, the complete packages within the budget book. But at the seventh grade level, uh, English language arts, you can see that Chelmsford outperformed uh, all 10 of its peer districts, as well as the state, in uh, scoring. 69% uh, of all students scored in either the meeting or exceeding expectations category, which again is, is phenomenal, so I wanted to point that out for you. At the mathematics level, uh, Chelmsford finished second to the top right behind Eastern, again uh, above each of the eight comparable communities and certainly the state average when it came to seventh grade mathematics scores. So it really speaks highly to the education our students in the schools are receiving, the very good work that our teachers and administrators in the buildings um, are doing to uh, really make sure that our students are benefiting. Our scores are even more phenomenal at the high school, and this is, again, something to be very proud of. And this really starts from the elementary school grades on, as our elementary school teachers and support staff are preparing our students to get to middle school and then high school. And you can see uh, in the 10th grade, among our English language arts tests that all of our 10th grade students take, 99% of our students scored in either the advanced or proficient category uh, above each of our 10 uh, top districts that we compete with uh, comparability-wise, as well as far exceeding the state average. Again, a huge accomplishment, and we're very proud of our staff and students uh, for performing this well. Again, at mathematics, uh, Chelmsford performed. 95% uh, of our students scored either advanced or, um, or proficient on the MCAS test. Again, top of our 10 uh, districts, our comparable districts in the state, and certainly above the state average. So without belaboring it uh, too much, I just wanted you to have that flavor for how our students are actually uh, scoring. Again, a lot due to the funding uh, that you appropriate to the schools. We're very much appreciative, and uh, we're proud that our students and staff are doing so well in the schools. So moving into the uh, budget, just a couple of highlight slides for you. Our current fiscal uh, 2018 budget, last town meeting last spring, you appropriated $57 million to the school department. Uh, we've worked very closely with uh, town manager Cohen and his financial staff around our fiscal 2019 operating budget. Uh, the town manager had recommended a $2 million increase to the schools, and we have before you this evening a budget that reflects the $2 million increase to uh, $59 million. That's approximately a 3.5% increase year over year. Some of the assumptions are some of the highlights that have been built into that uh, figure. We've updated all of our salaries in accordance with the collective bargaining agreements, so we've taken into consideration all step increases our staff have by contract and any lane changes, so any staff that have notified us if they're going to be taking additional um, uh, college work or graduate coursework to entitle them to a bump in um, pay, we've incorporated that in. We have uh, incorporated an extra $50,000 net increase in uh, special education tuition. Uh, we think this is actually, if you look year over year, a uh, much uh, lower rate than we have seen as an increase in the past. We have been uh, obviously applying for as much circuit breaker reimbursement funding we can from the district, so you're only seeing a net $50,000 increase in uh, special education costs this year. Um, the budget does include an $88,000 increase for student transportation costs, so our big bus contract, if you see the big buses on the road, we're going into the third year contract with our big buses, and that did in include an $88,000 increase in cost. We need to do some shifting within our budget to uh, bring some positions uh, back to the district, which haven't, um, uh, ha we haven't had in a number of years, but we're doing that by trading off some positions. So. Uh, we have three new positions that are going to be joining us next year. One, back in 14-15, we had to eliminate, due to budget um, cuts, our English uh, language arts coordinator. So this budget actually brings back that position. 
We also have a situation at our two middle schools where we have one uh, English language learner teacher who splits between uh, the two buildings, but our populations of uh, students who are in need of those services has dramatically increased over the years. So this actually adds another ELL teacher so that each middle school can have a full-time teacher as opposed to having one person splitting between the two buildings. And the budget for the third uh, kind of position that we're bringing back is a full-time dedicated uh, registered nurse for the Parker Middle School. Um, so those three positions are going to be technically new to our budget for next year, but to be able to make the numbers work, we've had to reduce uh, three positions in the district. So at uh, McCarthy Middle School, based on uh, student enrollment, we're actually uh, phasing out two sixth grade teachers. We're reducing a strand of middle school at the uh, Parker School. So those two positions are, um, are being eliminated. One second. And then, I'm sorry, then a teaching position at the high school, again, due to course enrollment. Uh, as we've talked about in previous budgets, our enrollment is actually higher at the elementary school uh, than it gets more manageable at the middle and it's less at the high school right now. Um, so we're basically trading off those three positions. It's not three new positions to the budget, but we're reallocating based on our immediate needs. And then lastly, one of the issues that we've been talking about for a number of years is staffing levels at our elementary schools. We currently operate with a one administrator model, so we only have one building administrator in each of our four elementary schools. We would love to be able to bring on a second administrator and assistant principal with our schools. Uh, two of our schools are at or over 500 students now, and the other two are uh, just below. But uh, our, again, our enrollment is actually increasing at that level, and we're going to need to move to having a second administrator in those buildings. We don't have the funding to do that right now. Uh, full time to have one in each building. So we're going to start the initiative this year and add a half time uh, assistant to each of the four schools. So technically we'll hire two uh, positions, but they'll each split and cover two schools. The budget does, uh, we've also done a lot of talking if you're following school committee meetings at uh, student social emotional learning and well-being. And this does, uh, included in the budget, have a couple of items to support that. Uh, first, we have identified some school-based uh, social-emotional MTS teams. Uh, there is funding in here to provide a small stipend for our building staff to continue that training. And then uh, secondly, at the elementary school level, we had a coordinated program review conducted by the Department of Education this past year, and one of the areas that they cited us on that we needed to do some uh, work on, which we uh, knew we had a, a lack of programming at, was a, a therapeutic program at the elementary school level. So we need to have a continuum of programming for all students, you know, K through 12. We have a therapeutic program at the middle school and the high school level. We don't have one at the elementary school level. So when students present with certain needs, we end up at the elementary school level, unfortunately sending those students to out-of-district placements, and then it's very difficult to get those students uh, back in uh, to our middle and high school program. <clears throat> so we've earmarked, and we have a team right now working on exactly what that program will look like but we've earmarked funds within the budget to be able to uh, implement that therapeutic program in the fall, and then we'll have a continuum of programming from K through 12, so I think that's very significant. The budget itself, again, uh, takes into consideration all funding sources, so we are utilizing our local appropriation from town meeting, uh, circuit breaker funding that comes from the uh, state for special education reimbursement, school choice funds, uh, any reimbursements will receive through Valley Collaborative, so this is an inclusive budget that does, again, incorporate all available funding sources to support the schools. Uh, and lastly, again, we've worked very closely with uh, Town Manager Cohen, appreciate his support, his team's support, in bringing forward this recommendation of 59 million, uh, which again, uh, matches the uh, Town Manager's recommendation for the school department for this year. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 4. Does the Board of Selectmen have a recommendation? Board of Selectmen approves Article 4 unanimously. Does the School Committee have a recommendation? The School Committee voted 5-0 to zero to approve. Thank you. This is an opportunity for uh, questions and answers, discussion. Will Wagner, Precinct 8. Um, Mr. Moderator, through you to the previous speaker. You, um, you said that you were eliminating uh, two teaching positions of sixth grade out of McCarthy School, but that would uh, maintain the staff to student ratio. Um, so eliminating those two teachers, uh, what is the class size going to be for the sixth grade at McCarthy next year? 
Sure, uh, both of our middle schools, McCarthy and Parker, uh, will have elementary school class sizes um, of under 25, um, anywhere between probably 22 and a maximum of 25 students per class. What we had um, had is we have eight strands currently, or eight uh, homerooms at each of the schools at McCarthy, uh, and we only had six at Parker. We have about the same uh, number of students going to both buildings. So our class enrollment was actually um, higher at Parker than it was McCarthy. A year ago, we eliminated um, two fifth grade uh, teaching positions and class size in the fifth grade. Again, now they have six sections instead of eight. Uh, I want to say is uh, 22, 23. It's certainly under 25. So those fifth grade students will be moving up to sixth grade and certainly don't need to go from six teachers to eight. Um, so we're ma basically maintaining that six to six. Uh, and, transition. But you did say that the elementary school teachers, uh, the elementary school was uh, higher attendance than previous. So uh, how does that take into account the fifth grade, uh, incoming fourth graders now who are going into fifth grade? Correct. Our current uh, fourth grade is actually one of our largest classes if you look at our current enrollment, K through five, I'm sorry, K through four. Um, so that's why instead of having say 22, 23 as a class size, we may be up to 24, 25 in some of those classes. Based on our current projections, uh, we're not seeing classes going over 25. Thank so you. the school committee does have a guideline of uh, 25 or under. Thank you. Susan McKinnon, Precinct 7. Um, I see that you have the uh, um, addition of that elementary therapeutic program, but in the staff list, I don't see anything listed about a teacher for that program. So where are you accounting for that money? Sure, within the uh, budget itself, and I can get the page number for you in a second, uh, we have an earmark. Um, it's, right now it's listed in the non-personnel section, so it's more of like a contracted services section. We have an earmark of $300,000, and we have a team of teachers and administrators who are actually looking at what our program um, should look like as far as staffing is concerned. So the, the uh, school committee will be receiving a report at their meeting in May that actually has a recommendation of what the program will look like as far as staffing is concerned and then they will vote to uh, move the funds from uh, that particular non-personnel line item to whatever type of personnel we're gonna uh, end up employing. So, so it, it may be a combination. Be well, no, there'll certainly be staffing, um, but we just, we didn't wanna preemptively um, decide what type of staffing levels would be appropriate. We really wanted the staff who are gonna be working with the students to be able to have input into that process. So uh, the $300,000 is in the budget. Uh, and again, the school committee will need to vote once they receive the report and recommendation to move it to the proper uh, pages of proper accounts within the budget. So you mean it may not necessarily be a special education teacher, it might be headed by a different type of personnel, it, is that what yeah, you're Yeah, it thinking? depends. There are a lot of different, um, I mean, there will certainly be teachers involved, but there are a lot of different districts that um, staff these programs a little bit differently. Some utilize, uh, like BCBA, behavioral support um, to help oversee the programs. Some utilize uh, social workers, obviously regular ed teachers, special ed teachers, paraprofessionals. But we didn't want to put out, because the team was working on this, the staffing model uh, before they had an opportunity to make a recommendation to us. So we do have the funding identified, and uh, that will be uh, wrapped up by the end of May. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Tom Moran, Precinct 8. Uh, I'm curious, at the high school level, does the curriculum include a teaching American history? Uh, what? Teaching American history, yes. Yes, I, all students take uh, American history. Thank you. I'm sorry, I just couldn't hear you when you spoke. Thank you. Again, Paul Rigazio. Uh, uh, precinct 7, just actually two non-financial questions. In going through the budget, I noticed that you indicated that economically disadvantaged students have gone from like 8%, 10%, 11%. Is, is there any reason for that? Is, are we drawing those type students into the, into the system? It surprised me we have 11%. Economically yeah, I, disadvantaged. Right. I think one of the re I just I put that in the budget to kind of highlight to the fact that some of our demographic is changing. Our student population is changing. The more uh, students who are identified with either special needs or Eng as English language learners who don't have English as a primary language, it is more expensive to uh, to educate those students. Oh, I understand. So I'm over the years, our demographic is changing. And the other question I have is, I see that in your, your seventeen percent of the students have have. Disabilities. I mean, I'm just, that surprises me. We have that high a level of students with 
I assume that's mental and physical, dis not just physical disabilities. It would be any of our students that are on an IEP or an individualized ed plan. Uh, and you'll see averages across the state would be anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of the student population uh, would be identified as needing special education services. Okay, okay thank you. You're welcome. Question. Thank you. Any others? There being none, we will now vote <clears throat> on uh, Article 4 to appropriate $59 million to defray the operations of the Chelmsford Public School System. The brevity of the discussion, uh, uh, both in terms of the presentation and the follow-up questions from the town meeting reps, gives you a sense of the uh, being on the same pageness of the school committee, the school superintendent, superintendent Dr. Lang, and, and uh, Paul Cohen, the town manager. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, just a few years, when uh, the school department was roiled with uh, controversy and uh, questions of financial mismanagement. That has all been smoothed, and uh, you're, seeing, you're, seeing, you're, seeing, you're seeing now uh, an acknowledgement that things are better and, uh, and, and being run well. Uh, th uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Article 5 is the fiscal year 2019 assessment to the Neshoba Valley Technical School District. The requested appropriation is $3,042,583. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Denise Pigeon, the Superintendent of Schools, to present the overview for the Neshoba Valley Technical School District budget. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to say thank you in advance to the town of Chelmsford. Um, earlier in the school year, we did have an issue with a roof leak during some of the bad weather, which um, unfortunately put our basketball teams out of a gym for several weeks, right as we were leading into the start of our basketball season. I reached out to Paul Cohen, and he was very gracious and allowed our students to use the gym in the town hall. So thank you from our students. We ended up having a, a wonderful season. Um, in terms of our presentation today, when we speak about our budget, I think it's really important to talk about what a budget funds. And um, to do that, I, would, I wanted to share with you from the voices of the students what our school has to offer and what our school is all about. So we're going to start with a very brief four and a half minute video uh, from a student perspective. Re remember that you have a 10 minute limit, so. It's a four minute video. That's fine. And we can keep going. It sounds like there might be an issue with the sound. That's fine, thank you. We'll go back to the PowerPoint. I would encourage you to visit our website to view the video if you get a chance. So as you know, Neshoba Valley Technical High School is made up of eight of our district towns. Um, we have, it started in 1965 and Chelmsford was one of our founding members. We have a 14 member school board that governs our school. We do have several members from Chelmsford that are here with us this evening. I would like to point out Mr. Donald Ayer in the back as our secretary, Mr. Lawrence McDonald, Mr. Richard DeFreitas, and Ms. Maria Carafellis is currently serving as the alternate for Chelmsford. Overview of school offerings. Again, we offer full academic and technical programming in um, state-of-the-art technical programs, preparing students for the workforce after graduation. We also offer industry credentials for our students. We feel that it's really important for them when they graduate to be prepared to enter the workforce and to have as many skills as they can to have a cutting edge. In terms of our basic enrollment, you can see this is the enrollment breakdown. Chelmsford is currently about 30% of our student population. Overall, in our enrollment trends, we have seen a slight decline in our overall enrollment over the last couple of years. However, it is important to note that Chelmsford has continued to have an increasing in enrollment for the last few years. Um, but if you look at it from a 20 year perspective, it has been a slight decline over the last couple of years. 
again, when you're talking about a school budget, I think accountability is very important. Um, again, Chelmsford has two fantastic public schools for students to choose from. Uh, we, as well at Neshoba, are doing very well in terms of district accountability, and we currently are a level one school. Our students do perform very well on MCAS. In addition to that, um, we have rates for our attendance that are above the state average. Our four-year graduation rate is above the state average. We have a very low dropout rate, again, below the state average. Um, we, 100% of our students complete mass core requirements, which is a rigorous course of academic study. And our suspension rates are below the state average. So accountability-wise, um, Neshoba Valley Technical High School is doing very well. This is one of my favorite indicators of success for Neshoba Tech, and this is called positive placement. Technical high schools across the state are required to reach out to the graduates one year after they graduate to see how they're doing. Um, as you can see, 99% of our recent graduates were positively placed, and that means that they've either entered post-secondary education of some sort, they are working in their field of study, or they're in the military. Sharing the good news, we were so proud that Governor Baker did make a visit to our technical school earlier in, in the year. As you know, over the course of two years, we were very aggressive with some state competitive funding that was available, and we were fortunate to be one of the few schools that did win a competitive grant bid to improve our technical programs two years in a row. Um, so he did come out and join us for a ribbon cutting. It was fantastic. He spent quite a bit of time getting to know our students, and, and it was a wonderful opportunity for them. Here are some photos from the, from the ribbon cutting and the Engineering Academy, all thanks to the grant. In addition, I wanted to share with you some of the capital projects that were funded through last year's budget. We were able to renovate our automotive technology program and our auto body collision repair and refinishing program. Both had not uh, been renovated since the project and um, had the original floors. So you can see we have beautiful new floors in that area. In terms of the budget, an overview of the process. Our process, as you know, starts very early on in October, um, working through from the staff up, building the budget. Um, it did go to a public hearing in the middle of the winter. We did present to town officials, and we've been um, visiting with finance committee members from our eight towns. The overview of our budget, um, all together, this is all spending for our budget, and we are at about a 3.5% increase overall. Some of the major changes that you would see, um, again, step and lane changes have been built in. Um, we have had some increases in special ed costs. Our special ed percentages have, have increased. We're at about 34% population of special education students currently. We've also had a significant increase in our transportation um, contract. We do have a new contract and, and it was an increase. Still within um, an amount that would be comparable to comparable districts. This is a breakdown of our capital plan. As you know, Neshoba's budget um, does fund everything that is related to Neshoba Tech. That includes all of the services that we have for teaching, all of our staffing. That also includes insurance. Uh, that includes the cost of the building and maintaining the building. So what we've done over the course of time is try to maintain that cost. So you'll see what we have earmarked this year for our capital projects. Um, we have to replace a digital lighting system. We have been working on replacing the rooftop units. We have 22 rooftop units on our building um, for heat, and we've been working on those as well. So you can see the breakdown for this year for a total of 225,000 in this current budget proposal. This slide breaks down the assessment to the towns. So this is the amount that is, is raised through town assessments. This is not the entire budget, but it does show you the breakdown. It shows you Chelmsford's breakdown. Again, Chelmsford has had an increase in student population. Um, Chelmsford is up by seven students, which is where you see the connection to the increase in the assessment to the town of Chelmsford. This slide breaks down the financial plan for the district. So you'll see that we have the breakdown for the district assessments, and then the additional funds that come in through state transportation reimbursements, state aid. And then you'll see that what we have done is put 100% um, of our ex excess and deficiency from the previous year's budget back into the budget. And then we've offset the remaining with school choice funds for total spending. The other two items to note on this slide, other post-employment benefits. Again, because we do fund our, our um, health insurance costs, we also have a liability for OPEB. Our current OPEB liability is about 12 million, and we are working on a long-range plan to fund that. We will be pl planning to put 200,000 into OPEB 
and 100,000 into stabilization. And just to conclude, we are very active in terms of seeking community service projects. I know I bring this up every year here in Chelmsford, but again, Chelmsford always comes out with some wonderful, great projects for our students to work on. So please think about it, and if you have ideas for students to do some work, to have some real-world experience, and give back to their towns, great opportunity. Um, I love to share this picture. It's a beautiful facility. We were proud to be able to help. We've been very active with Habitat for Humanity. We're actually building a couple of local homes now and we'll continue to do so. That's a very active projects for plumbing, carpentry, and electrical. Um, and our engineering program has also been involved in design work as well. You see we recently built some, some sheds in Groton, which was another fun project. And I have to always thank our generous donors and, and benefactors. Um, we always have wonderful folks reaching out um, and we're not afraid to ask. So again, thank you to our generous donors and benefactors. Every year they do help give back and offset costs to the budget. And last, I just wanted to share a slide of two uh, wonderful students that are student representatives to the school committee this year, um, Zelie Sears and Chantel Suero. They were very proud to serve as the student ambassadors and visit with the governor when he did, when he did come. I wanted to share that slide with them. They love that picture. And that concludes the formal presentation. Any questions I'd be glad to ask, answer. Thank you very much. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? A majority of the Finance Committee recommends approval of Article 5. Does the Board of Selectmen have a recommendation? The Board of Selectmen approves the article unanimously. Now is the opportunity for questions and discussion. Hi, sorry I haven't been watching things as closely as I had in the past. Mary France, Precinct 6. What's the current status of your stabilization fund? The stabilization fund is currently at 1.4 million. This will bring our stabilization to 1.5. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Carl Styling, Precinct 4. Have you ever had an opportunity to look at integrating your transportation costs with your member school districts rather than having a separate transportation? We haven't looked into that. I'd have to check into whether or not we could do something like that. Um, it, the, the laws that, that govern transportation for a traditional public school and a regional school are different. Um, but that's something I can check into. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? There appears to be none, so we will now vote on Article 5, which is to uh, uh, appropriate $3,042,583 for the uh, Neshoba Valley Technical School District Assessment. The article passes 144 in favor, two opposed, one abstention. Ms. Manager, Article Thank you, 6. Mr. Moderator, Article 6 is the fiscal year 2019 general operating budget. Um, the motion there, you can see, we're appropriating over $62 uh, million. Dollars. And sort of, I recognize the 10 minute time limitation, so I'm going to get sort of directly to the point and the sort of the elephant that's in the room this evening. So, how do we get to a point where the town manager's recommended budget um, does result, will result in the closure of a fire station for the upcoming fiscal year? Um, so, to remind the town meeting body uh, in terms of uh, these are the line items from municipal administration, public safety, public works, facilities and so forth, they're all in your, your handouts before you. I went over them at the pre-town meeting, so I will not, um, will not um, go through each item line by line. 
But we begin, begin our process every year at the 1st of October. Budget requests go out. That's followed by tri-board meetings between the Selectmen School Committee and Finance Committee. Uh, and then I produce a recommended budget at the end of January in accordance with our bylaws. And then the Finance Committee holds hearings in February and March and then produces their report uh, that you have in your hands this evening and recommended budget documents. And then obviously the fly in the ointment this year was that on March 26th, we received the arbitration award pertaining to the Firefighters Union Collective Bargaining Agreement, which you approved earlier this evening under Article 2. Um, and, and really that was the um, sort of the crux of the situation. The town has 14 labor unions, um, and there's obviously coordination that takes place between the town manager, the board of selectmen, and school committee during that process because on the town side, we sit across from the bargaining table with the firefighters union, the police patrol officers union, the police superiors officers union, the public safety dispatchers union, the highway laborers union, the cemetery employees union, the public facilities employees union, the library employees union, and the clerical union. And then the school department, of which I sit with them for collective bargaining purposes, we sit across from the table from the teachers and nursing collective bargaining group, the school administrators union, the school professional support, or PSP, personnel union, the school building custodians union, and the school uh, food service personnel union. And then we also have to deal with the non-union general government and school department employees. And um, as we began this process for the three fiscal years for the collective bargaining period of, of 17, 18, and the upcoming one in 19, we examined the labor market and, uh, and our limited resources, and we had an overall guideline of 2% per fiscal year for the contracts. And at this point in time, um, through the process, we've achieved agreement um, with 11 of those. Uh, then this evening, you voted the, at the two, two, and two parameters. And then this evening, you funded the agreement at the um, three, two, and two. They got the extra percent for the EMT stipend that you heard about earlier this evening. Um, and then again, out, remaining out there are the two police unions, the police superior officers, the, which are the sergeants, and the police patrol officers who are now uh, in the arbitration process and looking towards what happens here this evening. Um, the, so again, we had a pattern of settlement. Um, again, the police and fire have a unique process as, as the assistant town manager, Mike McCall, re related earlier, where they have the ability under state law to go to this arbitration, mediation and arbitration process that comes back to the community for an award that is not available to other employees. Um, and again, the game changer is the fact of the, um, if the, is the, fact of the staffing of apparatus. Um, so again, if you look at the major expenditure increases when we prepare the budget, you know, we, we've, we see we have a $2 million or 3.5% increase in the public schools. At this point, the second largest line item in that budget is a half million dollar appropriation to the fire department personnel services uh, at the 10 staffing level, a minimum. We also have a half million dollar pension assessment to Middlesex Retirement System. Our health insurance came in good this year. We, our increase was only 1.9% on premiums, so the budget was increases under 300000 the Neshoba Tech assessment you just voted earlier, the increase was 155,000 or over 5%, snow and ice removal. Uh, we're running state elections this year, so we, we have to build all these factors into the budget. Um, so when we now moving ahead, we um, go through the process. It's gonna take me a moment to get to slide 83. We'll get there. We have a staffing model in the fire department where we, where we run four platoons, basically to cover 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You have 13 firefighters per shift um, and a captain assigned to each shift, as you can see in the, in the right-hand side of that graphic. Uh, so in essence, um, we, have, we run with 13 firefighter staff. We've traditionally gone down to a staffing level of 10 and one captain, five stations, minimum of two. Uh, and basically the firefighters work two days a week, eight, you know, two, which a shift is a 24-hour 24, 24 tour of duty, a 10-hour shift, a 14-hour shift. They do that twice a week, eight times a month, and, and that's how it works. Uh, and for decades, this has been the deployment method of the community, as, although we've ebbed and flowed with the economic conditions. Um, the, um, 
we, we've looked at this station. Again, we've got the five station configuration that we've inherited from our predecessors. Obviously, the new station headquarters was built in 2014. And you can see the other stations were built in the late 50s and, um, and, and, and up until the most recent one in Rivenick Road in, in 1976. And again, that's our station configuration model of the 222 with the four outlying stations. The balance of five uh, are assigned to the center. And then obviously, if people are out for injured on duty, uh, vacation, personal bereavement, what have you, we go down to this 10-person minimum. Um, we did study this issue uh, when we were studying the staff, the configuration. We were studying about the replacement of the fire headquarters facility um, back um, just over a decade ago, we conducted a fire services study utilizing the MMA consulting group. Um, they came back with a confirmation of, of how the town was deployed and why, and, and I'll just sum it up in a nutshell. The primary objective of the regional response the system is to deliver a first due fire company to a fire or EMS incident within four minutes of travel time, 90% of the time. The current transportation network and availability of land for construction and relocation facilities limit the ability of the town to meet the four minute measure. The town currently meets this criteria 86% of the time. So that's the station model. Um, we, we then go to the uh, process. We, we, um, at that time, we also had a station study facility committee back in 2007 where we studied the future of, of public works and, and DPW facilities. Uh, and we had a nine person committee of which five of those people were firefighter background. We had uh, Chief Jack Perro, who was our fire chief at the time, was also the president of the National Fire Chiefs Association. We had John Kivlin, who was the fire union representative. We had um, Paul Erickson, who was a citizen representative with the fire department. We had Henry Hull, known as Hank Hull, who was also a citizen representative. And we had Bill Dalton, who was a selectman representative, who was a former firefighter to the committee. They met uh, during that process, completed this report back in of 2007, and recommended that we maintain the five station model rather than consolidate to a four station uh, configuration. Um, and again, we, we run with 13 firefighters per shift with 10 firefighters minimum. Again, two at all five stations at five times. When we went into the bargaining process, this, this cycle with the firefighters union and into the arbitration process, the firefighters were requesting a minimum of 17 firefighters at all times. And what that would comprise of was three at each of the four outlying stations, which gives you 12, and then three to the ladder truck uh, or engine one in the center station, which got you to 15, and then two additional to the rescue in the center station. That was 17 firefighter minimum. And again, our current right now is a 10 person minimum and a 13 person assignment. Obviously the numbers for that were astronomical. Uh, you're really approaching a couple million dollars to achieve that when you factor in all the benefit costs, times, and so forth. That wasn't acceptable and certainly we couldn't have planned for such a budget contingency. And fortunately that was not the outcome of the arbitration process. Um, the uh, union presented an One expert. minute left. Go ahead. One minute. Okay, well, basically the point wasn't, and I may ask, Mr. Martin, if I may have, you did say you'd give some discretion for additional time if that would be required. Um, I'm trying to examine the town's holistic budget, Mr. Moderator. But anyway, the bottom line is we ended up with an award where one station has to be uh, manned by three firefighters to responding at all times. Um, and again, the easier configuration would be to, well, if we run with four with two, why not go with two with two stations with four people, just flop and close two stations? Well, that's not acceptable and doesn't meet the model for the community in terms of staffing. Um, so yes, sir, we acknowledge that the, the international firefighter standards uh, and protocols that you should have two men in, two men out. But again, that's not how Chelmsford has historically been staffed. And Mr. Martyr, will you be granting me additional time or not? Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Briefly. I will be brief, uh, and I'll just be a few more moments. moments. Um, again, the award comes down with three, at any one time, one of the apparatus has to be staffed by three. This can be achieved, obviously, in two manners. One is to close one of the stations, which will allow the town to meet the one apparatus with the three firefighters standard while maintaining the 10 firefighter minimum per shift. The other alternative of achieving the uh, arbitration standard of three firefighters keeping all five stations open would require an additional supplemental appropriation 
um, to increase the minimum staffing from 10 to 11 firefighters at all times based on the current attendance uh, records uh, of, of utilization by the firefighters, that would cost an additional appropriation of $245,000. That would increase the fire department personnel budget to 9.77% or, or just under $550,000. The problem with this solution is it's not a financially sustainable, nor is it the end of the situation. The firefighter safety issues are not fully addressed clearly. Um, as again, only one of the five stations would be staffed with a minimum of three firefighters. And as you heard earlier in my comments, the goal is for all stations to be staffed with three, uh, five, as well as two for the rescue. And then ultimately the true goal is to have four, two in, two out, which would be four people on responding apparatus. Um, therefore, we will be revisiting this issue in future collective bargaining and, and arbitration processes. Um, I remind the board that we have the police officers union and the police superior officers union are currently in arbitration at the Joint Labor Management Committee seeking settlements uh, in a process that would include consideration of the town's increase in funding for the fire department operations. This fall, we'll be returning to the bargaining table with all of the 14 labor unions in the community. Um, and I'll just close by noting that, yes, this is, a diff this is a public safety need. None of us, neither Chief Ryan nor myself, are comfortable with the concept of, of closing a fire station. Um, however, it's our responsibility to provide you with not only the short-term but the long-term implications of, of what take place. And the bottom line is there are other met unmet needs within the community um, and again, we have to look at it in a holistic manner, which is why we go through this budget hearing process and work with the finance committees. Um, for example, in the police department, the police department is understaffed compared to historic staffing levels. And what that results in is the fact that we have no traffic unit to address neighborhood safety issues, such as the speeding and, and traffic problems that go on through our, through our neighborhoods, uh, which we're mindful of. That's a safety threat to the community as well. Uh, for children and others who are on the roads. Uh, we have an understaffed detective division that's trying to deal with today's challenges, including the opioid crisis and other major incidents. And we do not have full-time resource officers in each of the middle schools. The public works is also understaffed from historic staffing levels, which has resulted in an in in inability to adequately maintain the town's 28 buildings, deal with all the potholes and road issues, deal with the tree trimming and power issues that come up, and drainage infrastructure. The Board of Health has an inability to adequately inspect food establishments, particularly those that are risky and would warrant more than one annual inspection per year. And you heard from the superintendent earlier this evening regarding the additional needs for curriculum coordinators, psych psychological positions, English language learners, special education, and social workers. There are many needs, is my point, across the community, and these ought to be addressed in a holistic manner, and we are trying, attempting to do that. And we also have concerns by those who are seeking that the town not tax the full levy limit. I think that the, the following PowerPoint slide, um, again, gives you that insight uh, in terms of what have been the historic staffing levels across our public safety, and I include public works as part of public safety, in, during the last 25 years. And as you can see, the staffing level right now in the fire department is, at, is as high as it's ever been. You can see the peak was 63 back in 99, um, and then went through 2002, and then we hit a recessionary period, and then the recessionary period when I was here was in 2009, uh, bottomed out where we had to close the South Station. We were able to reopen that back in 2012, um, and then we've been at 62, 63 since that point in time. If you look at police, you can see that the police are currently staffed at 69. There's certainly a number down from their 78 unit staffing level, which was their, which was their peak in, in 2000, 2001, 2002 period. And clearly their calls and demand for service uh, with homeland safety, school issues, opioids and so forth, they're great and telling as well. Uh, and also public works, they're at 27 and a half below their peak of 41 personnel, again, during the high, high water period of the early 2000s. Um, so again, we had, we had asked your consideration of this article um, this, this evening, and, and in closing, um, I just want to point out that the, for the past 11 and a half years, I've been a strong advocate for public safety, including firefighter safety. As Chief Ryan's slides in your presentation illustrate, the town has invested over $11.4 million, including a new fire department headquarters facility, 
a new $1.1 million ladder truck, new fire engines for each of the five fire stations, and a second set of turnout gear during my tenure. I've also led the consideration of a town-operated ambulance service. However, I do not support going down what I see as a financially unsustainable path, and I ask for your support uh, as my budget as presented. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, for the additional time. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? After a revote this evening at a meeting of the Finance Committee, a majority of the Finance Committee recommends approval of Article 6. Does the Board of Selectmen have a recommendation? The Board of Selectmen endorses the article by a vote of 4 to 1. Okay. Um, point of order. Please uh, identify yourself. Uh, Brian Latina, Precinct 4, point of order. How would a representative amend this article and take from Warrant Article 7 um, $200,000 from the reserve budget in order to fund $200,000 on this article, Article 6, the fire department budget, in order to keep open the fire station? How might I, be, how might I amend this article to do that? You would, have to, you would have to move to take Article 7 out of order it would have to be approved by the town meeting, and then we would consider Article 7 and then go back to Article 6. Mr. Moderator, um, I move that we take Article 7 out of order for the purpose you just described. Point of order, Mr. Moderator, that really isn't necessary. We can just, if the, if the amendment to increase the appropriation of this article passes, when, as the motion maker for Article 7, I would reduce that by that, if that's the will of the town meeting body. So I can okay. save you from going through that parliamentary procedure of doing a revote okay. and so forth. I so let's, let's do that. Okay. Um, opportunity for questions, answers, and discussion. Mr. Moderator, Brian Latina, Precinct 4. Um, through you to the speaker and, and our folks here and the TV audience and chief and the firemen. Friday night, I re was returning from- are, are you involved? Are you discussing now or asking I'm questions? I'm in discussion, sir. Okay. Friday night, I was in, um, at a fundraiser at the Andover Country Club, and I witnessed at 11 o'clock at night a traffic accident on Route 133. Um, single car accident, the woman was a little inebriated, picked the wrong side of the um, road to drive around, hit a fire plug, and hit a tree. She was not injured, um, but the interesting part to me was um, it took about five minutes for the first police car to get to Andover, their main crossroads, Route 133 is the main drag right through town. They have five fire stations. A few minutes later, an ambulance fire department ambulance came in, two, two firefighters on board. Next truck in was a pumper truck with three firefighters on board. I noted that, that was interesting. Next truck in was a ladder truck with one firefighter, no others, one driving the ladder truck. Four other police cars arrived and then a wrecker came about 10, 15 minutes later. Point is, I had a long discussion with the deputy chief there and after I recognized that they knocked over a fire plug and hit a tree, and the tr car was actually a couple feet in the air, um, my recommendation to put a reflector on the tree kind of went, went aside, but we talked about the number of firefighters in those trucks and the fact that they all showed up. From a safety point of view, I was very concerned to see one firefighter in the ladder truck, but the deputy pointed out that he's following the pumper truck, which requires an engineer, and two firefighters. So every time they take off out of there, they're following the ambulance truck who act as firefighters if there's a fire, and then the pumper truck gets there, and they have three men on board. So the, the latter truck is simply arriving. You know, if there was an accident with his truck, it'd be an issue. But that may be a solution to the same problem we have here. So I would like to see the South Station remain open I'm very concerned that our knee-jerk reaction is to simply close it and hope, hope the houses in the south section of town don't catch fire. We had a fire in that area recently. We've seen other ones in that area. It could take a long time to get there. We could lose people. 
putting money aside, $400,000 for the possibility of the Finance Committee needing it over the course of time. We just moved some money around tonight for that purpose, so all year we didn't need it. When's the next time we're going to need a firefighter in that, tr in that truck and a station active and ready to go? Let's take a year breather here and let the chief and everyone else figure out what we need to do with our fire stations. Keep South Station open. I don't live in that section of town, but keep it open for $200,000 shift in our money. Let's, let's consider that at town meeting tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Moderator, just so I can orient myself on where we are in this discussion, are, are you this discussing Glenn, or, or asking questions? Uh, I'm asking questions. Glen Thorne, yes. Precinct 5. Yes. South Chelmsford. Uh, so I'm trying to orient where, where we are with respect to the discussion of passing this request for the amount indicated or increasing the dollar amount by whatever's necessary, 245000 or something, to keep the South Station open. Where are we in this process exactly? I have not received any amendment to do that. So we are only dealing with the article that is before us. So you would need an amendment to increase the article that's currently here by Mr. Latino or myself uh, to, to increase the amount of money by 245000 in order to change this. Is that correct? That's right. All right. And at what point can we speak in favor of or in, uh, in uh, deference to this change? Well, right now we don't have an amendment, so we only can speak in favor or opposed to what's before town meeting. Okay, could you check with the town council to see if amendments being prepared at this moment? Because I see a lot of activity going on up there. Does it appear that an amendment is... is there, is, there is an amendment being uh, proposed. Okay, so I will stand by. Uh, Mr. Manager, the exact amount was what, four hundred and two hundred and forty-five thousand dollars four forty-five appropriation. Yeah, to personnel uh, services line number four forty-five. No, it was four forty-five. It would be line number three. It would increase the appropriation by two hundred and forty-five thousand. Having the extra firefighter or not, four forty-five. Mr. Manager, again. I, I, uh, the proponent is, is saying that it was 245. Is it 245? Yes, 245. 245. I believe, I believe that's what I said. I'm sorry. Mr. Moderator. Yes, Mr. Wagner, while we're waiting. Yes, I'd like Please to Please identify yourself by stating your name. <laughs> Will Wagner, Precinct 8. Uh, I'd like to speak to the original article. Certainly. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Town Manager, through the moderator to you, uh, as I understand, uh, this 245 would be just for funding for this year. Uh, you said that this is unsustainable in the long run. Uh, if we approved a change which incorporated the 245000 this year, mm -hmm. what would the impact be to next year? I mean, next year being FY 20? Next year, 2020, yes. It's uncertain, and let me explain. As I, I'll try to clarify why. Obviously, the 245, that's going to go up annually because you're, you know, you're having compounding. You're, you're now going to have your traditional step increases, your overtime rates, and everything will change. So that amount would increase in the future. But again, the 245 isn't the end of the story. The other impact on the budget is we still have these two other groups outstanding who are before the same panel who are going to look at the need of the community and basically the message is going to be, well, if the town of Chelmsford wants to fund it, they'll fund it. And so basically you'll be looking at probably a similar amount for the other safety unions, i.e. the two police unions, uh, would be a rational expectation for the outcome. So now you're really a half million dollars into the hole and then that's compounding going forward. So as I understand your uh, numbers here, 245 for the fire, could potentially equal a similar amount for police and public works and additional funding as they go into arbitration on their own contracts. Right, and, 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 and then, then going on beyond that, that year, you asked the question, how does it go for that ups, over the year? Now we're at the bargaining table with the other groups. And they're gonna say, you know, whether you're the teachers group or what have you, they're gonna say, hey, wait a minute. 
We want, our, we want parity or fairness with us as well, so they're not likely to come in around the town's guidelines as well in the future. So and as I said, I think it's a compounding effect, and that's why I said earlier, it's just more than just what's before us this evening. And additionally, if I understand correctly, this 245 is just to fund one additional staff member? It's one additional minimal staff member at all times. Per right? shift, Going yes. from the 10 to the 11, that's correct. But that still doesn't staff each of our five stations at three staff per it station. Would, it, it would guarantee that one of the five is staffed at three firefighters on an apparatus at all times. Exactly. So that's why I said I think we'll be going through this process iterative continually. I think that's a rational explanation. Thank you. I'd just like to Thank say that uh, at fall meeting, we approved $500,000 or nearly $500,000 for the uh, playground at Friendship Park. and. I'm somewhat but, disappointed but, that but, we're but willing to play, fund. But the playground is community preservation. Uh, That's not, those monies are not available for the operating budget. I, I understand that. I'm saying that the town wasted $500,000 on that when we could have been looking forward and uh, putting money back into the budget for future but you, consideration. But you can't. Those are different monies. Those are segregated monies. Thank you. Nancy you, Precinct 9. Uh, I happen to live in South Chelmsford, very close to the Westford line, and I'm very concerned about that fire station being closed for safety reasons and the amount of time it would take in my neighborhood if there was an emergency fire. So I hope people will, those of you who live in that area or who do not, maybe you consider those of us who do in your vote. Thank you. Dave Hadley, Precinct 3, been a firefighter for 30 plus years. Um, I, I, I don't think there's any question that um, other people are going to be looking for money, but I, I think that we really need to focus on what we're talking about right now, and that is the people in that area are going to be minus the fire station, and then you're still going to have the other engine companies with two firefighters on an engine, and maybe we'll have, you know, with the award, we'll have one extra, one, not even an extra, but a third firefighter on one engine only in the whole town, the other engines are still going to have two firefighters and you're going to have a closed station. So I, I'm fully aware of, you know, other people may be asking for money, but right now it's the people in that er area of town and the firefighters that are going to be on the engines with only two people that are going to be responding to these calls. And, and I just think we really need to focus on what the important issue here, which is the public safety of both the public and the firefighters with two men on an engine company. I'm not trying to invent money here, but we really need to focus on the public safety issue at hand, you know, one thing at a time. Everybody else is going to be able to have their say to ask for what they need when the time comes, but right now I think it's really critical that we focus on this one particular issue because it's extremely important to both sides, to both the public and the firefighters. Thank you. Thank you. A, uh, um, <clears throat> a motion has uh, been filed to amend. Excuse me, I'm still speaking on the main motion? Well, here, here's, here's the thing. Um, I have to address the amendment before, because we're going to be voting on the amendment before we vote on the main article. So... Could I ask a question concerning the budget that's presently in front of us. Sure. Uh, Sam Poulton, Precinct 8, through the moderator to the manager. Having listened to your comments, um, I can certainly see both sides of the issue, but my question is, is there something else coming before us on, that you know of on amendments, or are we dealing with the fire department tonight? I know things may come in the future, but tonight we're dealing with the fire department, correct? Yes, but again, our budget cycle begins tonight and doesn't get wrapped up till fall town meeting when the tax rate gets set in December. And as I spoke earlier this evening, I fully expect that we'll be bringing in arbitration awards for both the police patrol officers union and the police superior officers union to this body, most likely by fall town meeting. But tonight we only have the fire department. Well, to my knowledge, that's all that we have. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Mr. Latina, do you have a motion? Mr. Moderator, I have an amendment to the um, current motion. Um, my amendment is to amend Article 6, adding $245,000 
in order to fund the additional public uh, safety expense. No, so okay. It would have to be personnel services. For, yes, for personnel services. Use the word we'll expense. We'll write that in. Use the word. I just want to make sure it's correct in the record. I wasn't sure how it was being broken down as far as so, expenses. So I think it would be to amend line number three, personnel services, public safety, from $12,001,976 to $12,246,976. So John, John, can you make that, can you make that change? Mr. Moderator, while they're making that change, again, Two hundred and forty-five thousand dollars. Well, wait, wait, wait a second. Wait, wait, wait a second. We haven't we haven't gotten to that point yet. Okay. So we're just we, we want everybody to to know what they're voting on. So I'd like that to be available on the screen. So just so I guess it, it's not going to be on the screen right away. Basically, you're going to amend Article Six by adding $245,000 on public safety line item three, uh, raising the figure from $12,001,976 to $12,246,976. Now, Mr. Latina? That's correct. Um, I stand on my previous conversation to the town meeting, Mr. Moderator. The amendment is to simply fund this for the financial year 2019 with funds that we would normally set aside. Normally we'd set aside $400,000, I'll call it rainy day funds, so that the finance committee has some money to fix problems over the course of the year. Um, this particular year we didn't seem to need all that money until the very end. I know that, I know that none of us could stand up here next year and say, hey, we didn't spend the money and we lost a house with a couple of people in it. So that's the gist of this amendment. Give us the year, let the chief and our town administrator figure out what we need to do to fully fund our fire stations or reconfigure them in such a way to keep our firemen safe and our families safe. That's what town meetings should be doing. Thank you. Thank you. Glenn Thorne, Precinct 5. I have the uh, enviable position of agreeing with Brian on this <laughs> article, the previous distinguished speaker. And I think it's very important because time is, time is life. Uh, the distance from the center of town to Slay Road, for example, in South Chelmsford is about 4.2 miles, about nine minutes of driving time. Uh, if it was serviced by the West Fire Station, it's about six miles and 13 minutes of driving time. And there's always a question of how long does it take to get the alarm in, to get the uh, firefighters into the equipment and start moving out of the fire station. Uh, this is a surprise to me. I didn't know that we were going to be in a position of having to close a fire station in South Chelmsford and taking that risk that something may happen in the vicinity of that station. Station that could have been served by that station, but now will take minutes longer when seconds count. So I think what we need to do is take a look at the overall public safety concerns of the town because as a town manager has appropriately listed, there are, there are many. There are police concerns, there are DPW concerns with the roads in town, there are fire concerns and to come into this town meeting even after being informed at the uh, town manager's meeting earlier that we had this shortfall and that we were going to shut the South Station is a little bit too fast for me. So I think if we take the next year to take a look at the holistic, as a town manager says, needs of all the public safety issues of the town, perhaps we can come up with a more integrated plan on how to deal with it. But in the meantime, to increase the risk of the safety of structures and lives in South Chelmsford by closing the station, I think is the wrong thing to do. So I look at this $245,000 as an investment in taking the entire holistic picture and looking at it over the next year, and perhaps there's a redistribution of funds in our budget that we haven't found yet. Perhaps there's another way to increase the revenue to the town budget. Perhaps there'll be excess uh, free cash next year that we don't know about. So for this point in time, I heartily endorse this article because the safety of a good portion of our town is at stake 
at this point in time, and I think we need to take a look at that. We owe it to part of our town, like we would if they were closing the West Fire Station, and as we have in the past, take a look at it and see what we can do to buy back that year time, to look at all the issues of public safety, and maybe we can do it better, maybe we can't, but over the next year we can find that out without risking portions of our town for response times. So I encourage you to uh, support this amendment and vote in favor of it. Tom Moran, Precinct 8. I've lived in Chelmsford for over 53 years. I'm a Bowen. Uh, and I was the leader of the people who fought to reopen the West Fire Station in the 80s. The West Fire Station, when it closed, had a big banner on the doors saying fire station closed. How would you like to try to sell your house if you lived in that area during that time? I can tell you, you wouldn't. And that was what will happen to the people who live in South. But we're not just talking selling your house. We're talking public safety. I went to every fire station and I recorded response times and where they were compared to response times in the West Fire Station open. What you're talking here is response time. And we all know that response time is critical to any emergency, regardless of what it is. And I can tell you, the day they opened the West Fire Station, the next day, a person in Chelmsford, I won't identify, had a heart attack. And they were, his wife was driving him past the West Station. She pulled in, and they revived him. And I can tell you, there'll be a lot of stories about long response times. I absolutely support the amendment, and I think you should all realize that closing fire stations becomes a habit in some places. It shouldn't happen in Chelmsford. If we can give money to a uh, park to become the second Disney World, we can certainly open the fire stations, keep them all open. Thank you. Lori Coolis, Precinct 6. You want to push the microphone down? Thank you. Lori Coolis, Precinct 6. Um, I happen to also be a school nurse in the district, and I just want to remind everybody that there is the Byam School that is right next to the South Station. And with the closure of that, there'll be um, increased response times, and there are so many children and so many staff that we care for during the day. Um, and there have been many emergencies, and we really rely on the response times. So please consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Mary France, Precinct 6, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm diminishing the importance of public safety because I agree, I would love to, I certainly would like to make sure we see station, uh, the South Station remain open. And I'm sure if Paul had sees, would see that in our budget, in our revenue at this point, he would be enthusiastic about being able to do that. But I think we need to think about where we get 245,000. It was suggested we take it out of reduce the FinCom Reserve Fund because they don't spend it until the end of the year. Well, folks, we funded $350,000 tonight for this year's budget out of that 400,000. If that 400,000 were there, how would we have funded those items this evening? The previous fiscal year, we funded 350000 out of the $400,000 reserve fund. Yes, it may sit there for most of the year, but we have finished each fiscal year with 50000 left. So we need to think, as important as this issue is, and, and I don't dispute that in any way, where is the additional money coming from? And what do we do with the end of the year when we come up short with our budget? I just think we need to ask everybody to think about that in this total context. Thank you. Thank you. Henry Hull, Precinct 4. Um, I've been on the fire department as a captain almost 30 years. I was on the location study committee and the ambulance committee. Uh, one thing that blows my mind is taking this long to address staffing and safety. 
and I don't want to disown anybody. But I just want to point out, like, just this week alone, I had a structure fire, a rollover with a guy pinned, a car accident, two medicals, an engine fives area. We got there under four minutes. You close that station, it's going to go to 12 minutes. So forget the fire. If you're having a stroke or a heart attack, you're waiting an extra seven, eight minutes if we're available to get there. And it's the same with the ambulance. They're driving the same distance. So I urge you guys to vote for this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. John Plunkett, Precinct 4. I was wondering if we might hear from uh, Chief Ryan on this matter. I think it would be appropriate to ask the chief the safety effect uh, this, the closing of that station would have. Go ahead. I was wondering uh, if you could just address the safety uh, concerns okay. uh, regarding the closing of the I station. Mean, to, to be fair. Uh, maybe response times to that area. Right. So in the arbitration process, both union and management have an opportunity to relay our concerns, and certainly response times was communicated during the arbitration process. So I have to be careful what I say, because we have to support this arbitration award, but. I will say response times was brought up mm -hmm. as a concern. So how, how will they, the, the closing of the station affect response times? It will increase. In and we've seen that back in 2008 when we closed the station for three years. It will impact response times. Mm -hmm. And uh, concerns that you might have regarding <coughs> those response times? Again, the, the concerns are that, that we were able to bring up an arbitration is the ability to meet back in that study for 2007. We were able to get to a, a medical within four minutes, 90% of the time. Well, that, that's what you, that's the goal. Four minutes, 90% of the time. We were able to meet that 86 time, 86%. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that's probably dropped a little bit because we're a busier community. So that's my concern. So that your concern would be it would drop additionally? The, if the we drop, if we close the station, yes. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Maureen Foley, Precinct 5. Um, as the chief had just mentioned, the South Chelmsford station was closed recently. We all knew that was in a budget cycle where we were in a recession and we hoped that was temporary and it was and you brought it back. As I'm standing here tonight, it feels very different to me. This is a permanent decision from this point forward. I'm not ready with very little time to think about this to not expend this money to keep this station open another year while the community grapples with the ramifications. And I hope that you have more time uh, to study the complexity of this problem, but I am asking this body this evening to give us that one year to support this amendment because it is a serious, long-lasting problem. Thank you. Sue Carter, Precinct 5. Um, I vaguely remember, but I don't know the details, so I'd ask the chief if he recalls. Did we not close some of the outlying fire stations on a rotational basis? We, yes, we used to, when I, when I started with the fire department, we used to close it on a rotating basis. West would be closed on odd days. Engine four would be closed on even days. So yes, there was rotation. Okay, so this is discussion, not question. <laughs> um, I would just like to remind everybody, yes, I'm speaking because this affects my precinct, but it could just as easily affect your neighborhood as well. So we need to look at it collectively as a town and not as, well, I don't live in South, so it doesn't matter, it's not gonna affect me. You know, the North Station is two blocks away from me, I'm fine. Just keep in mind, this could affect everybody if we did it on a rotating basis. 
And just like this town unified, so we all got sewer. I think we all need to unify and look at public safety. It's not that it doesn't affect my neighborhood. It affects all of us as a community. And there's nothing saying that if it's south this year, it's not west next year, or, or North Chelmsford doesn't go on a, you know, a, a scaled back basis. So I think we all need to look collectively as how we're treating each other as a community and what's important. I mean, I think you probably have a lot more uh, rescue calls now than you ha ever have, medical calls. And those minutes can make a difference between life and death. If you have a child choking, do you want to wait an extra five minutes for somebody to show up? It's significant. It's not just, it's not always fires. A lot of it is medical calls. And sometimes those medical calls are even more important and more time sensitive than if it were a fire. Um, so I would encourage everyone to vote for this amendment. Thank you. Colleen Stansfield, Pre uh, Precinct 1. I just have a point of clarification. I mean, wasn't this an arbitration award that we both sides have to honor? That's been, that's been remedied. That was Article 2. The award has been voted. It's in place. We are now debating the fiscal year 2019 operating budget and the appropriation for the fire department. This, my recommended budget complies with the arbitration award. The question is, is what is our staffing level in terms of number of firefighters and minimum staffing level? My budget recommends a maintaining the historic 10 person staffing level, 10 firefighter staffing level. The request to, to keep all stations open would increase that to 11 firefighters, hence the additional 245,000. But either way it's voted, it will comply with the arbitration award that was funded earlier this evening. And the five stations remaining over was not something that was part of the arbitration award? No. In fact, the, the arbitration award does not address minimum manning. It's not allowed to by state law, nor did it direct which station would have the, uh, the additional fi third person firefighter on an apparatus. That decision is left to the fire chief to determine. Okay, so, and then my next question is, will the staffing levels of the fire department in general go down if one station is closed? No, it, we, it, we have the budget approved, so it, it will, right now we're down, so we're run down to 10, stay yes. status quo? Correct. Okay, but you have one more person that's gonna be on one apparatus and one station? Yes, that's the award. Okay, so I, I don't, could you have made this decision after town meeting about how to deal with the budget, or are you being open and transparent right now by saying that this could possibly be happening, a well, closing of the station? The fiscal year starts July 1. As I pointed out at the last Board of Selectmen meeting last Monday evening, we have two months prior to the start of the fiscal year. If the town meeting desired, we could table this and pick this up at, in, at a special town meeting sometime in May or June. Or conversely, we can address it at any time at a special town meeting, whether it be fall, fall town meeting or any other town meeting. The bottom line is the budget doesn't get finalized in terms of the tax levy until December. Um, so yes, this could be addressed either this evening at a special meeting and revisited at any time, including fall town meeting. So I think this is a lot of money to consider just taking out of you know, extra cash at the end of the year to fund for something that we don't even know we can sustain over time. So I think the best thing to do would be to wait on this, vote this down, and revisit it sometime this year when we have more time to think about it. Marlene Cody, Precinct 4. Um, I just have a question. Uh, so we're hearing a lot about uh, response times, and that's response times of the fire department. But both ambulance and police respond to all these calls as well, right? So this change isn't going to affect those response times. Yeah, I can ask Chief Spinney, who's in the audience this evening. Um, you may recall there was an incident reported last week about a child choking with the police were first responders and addressed that situation. But I'll have the chief respond. Uh, good evening, everyone. Let me just start off by saying we work with the FABMA, not against them. This is not a contest in any way. I'm sure everybody understands that. But to answer the question, uh, we have the town divided up into sectors. I don't want to get into the specifics, but there are an even number of sectors in town that are covered by patrol officers. Um, when those sectors are manned appropriately, our response time is four minutes. I ran an analysis for this year of all medical calls that we've gone to, five minutes or under. So to answer your question, 
Um, are, the, are the deployment of my resources changing? No. I'll further add that um, all the police officers in town are first responders. By law, we have to be. That's CPR, um, heart attack situations, uh, AED deployment, um, shock. Over half my patrol force and all of my supervisors are EMTs, which is that next level. So mm -hmm. we have worked towards this for a number of years because medicals are obviously a, an emergency situation. We go to every medical, uh, no matter what the level, an officer goes. So the short answer is the deployment of police officers is not changing. So response changes, response times are not going to change with this change. So I'm regardless of what station. happens tonight with the fire department manning, police resources are not changing. Thank so you. So I don't anticipate any change in how we go. Thank you. Um, that's a good, good information. Um, second question is, the fact that uh, all three departments respond to 911 calls, is that a law? Uh, is that required? It's not a law, but that's how we've been responding for the past 20 years, police, fire, we have a private ambulance company, Trinity, and also the ALS from Lowell General or Trinity. Yeah, okay. So it's a multi-agency response. So it's sort of just tradition at this point. It's not really decreed by any law or required. This is for medicals or, we're talking about. So right. Just, yeah. Yep. Right. Um, so would it make any difference to the fire department budget if they did not respond to medicals and it was only police and ambulance? I would not recommend that because it, it I, makes, I'm it not makes asking a whether you'd recommend it. I'm well, asking it makes if a difference it would change to the, the budget. Yes. So it, it does. It makes a difference to the patients because we're geographically located. I understand respond, that. So yes. But my question is, would it change the budget? No, it wouldn't. Would it change the budget? No. Okay. Thank okay, you. Okay. Thank you. David Hull, Precinct Seven. I'm also the uh, Union President for Chelmsford Firefighters Local 1839. Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank you for your support. Uh, we fully uh, support this amendment, uh, funding in full for the keeping the five-station layout uh, intact while a long-term solution is, is found. We understand that this is a hot-button issue. Uh, people are pretty passionate on both sides, and we're not looking to bankrupt the town. Uh, the fact is, we, the way that we run the two-man engine companies is unsafe. Uh, we've been pretty vocal about that. I'm sure a lot of you have heard. Some of the things that we've had to say about it, uh, and I'm not looking to further that debate, that fact is uncontested. Um, this was a modest staffing increase uh, that we've maintained this entire time, and the town's maintained that the five-station layout is the most appropriate layout for the town of Chumpsford, excuse me, based on response times. And we're just asking that in the interim, uh, you support this amendment to keep Engine 5 open to protect the citizens of that, uh, of that area, as well as the citizens across uh, the town of Chumpsford and the firefighters. If, um, if we don't put some serious thought into how this department is run, there's going to be a very negative public safety impact uh, either on the firefighters or on the town or maybe both. And that's not something we want to see. We're willing to work with the town in any way we can to make this safer for everybody involved. And uh, you know, if, if that just means buying some time, keeping all five stations open, and, and working towards a long-term solution together rather than going through this arbitration process and spending you know, thousands and thousands of dollars, then that's what we want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Beth Logan, Precinct 3. Um, I, I want to make sure that I understand the process that this amendment would take. It would, if I understand it right, it will increase the um, headcount of the fire department and those people would have to be hired and no. So, but we have to have the extra people, and we would be paying two hundred and forty-five thousand. Wouldn't we be doing that to hire more people? Can you slide it forward? No. What, what will happen is we'll keep. We will not hire any additional fire personnel. If you, the deployment model will still be thirteen firefighters per each of the four deployments. What's going to happen is it's going to go right to the overtime budget, and it's going to mean that instead of staffing overtime at a minimum of 10 people, we'll be forcing or, or volunteering others to come in and keep it at the 11 person minimum. So in other words, the bottom line is there's no additional people being hired. It's, it's it, because the problem is the hire is, is more expensive than alternative. No, that was those. It's basically increasing the, the overtime budget to buy an additional $245,000 so that we can, we can keep 11-person minimum instead of a 10-person minimum. Okay, so it would just be, in, that, 
that answered my next question, which is then how do you get rid of them if you change your mind? Um, so it would just be out of overtime, and how many, what would this mean that the average firefighter is working? How many more hours, how many do they work now on average, and how many more would they have to work to maintain this? I don't have that number in front of you as far as the overtime, but there is a, and I know this was brought up before, there is a provision within the collective bargaining agreement. There's a 48 hour limitation that the firefighters can work. After 48 hours, they have to go home. Okay, don't, I, I, like, I like my people rested when they come to save me, um, but I like them to be there as well. It's a tough, to, it's a very difficult issue here. So, um, it would keep it within that 48, is what you're saying. Correct. And we wouldn't have to hire any more. Right. Okay. And we have enough people from this analysis with including expected injuries or other things where we could maintain it. Yes. Okay. Thank yep. you. Yep. Anita Tanini, Precinct 4. I have a question since the president of the fire department was speaking earlier, and I believe they have their attorney here. I, from a negotiation perspective, because I know the town manager and the, it has to support this, but I just want to understand um, kind of what happened in the dialogue about when you brought up your concerns from a fiscal perspective, um, their opinion, because I know this has been an issue, right? Like I've, heard, I've been the liaison to the fire department before, so I know that the number three staffing has, has been an issue. But was there um, any type of compromise, like before we got to this point, it's three or nothing, you fully fund it this way, was there some sort of, did we, can we talk about, was there any middle ground that would have allowed us to keep all five stations open, but maybe only staffed at the peak stations, just something that instead of all or nothing? Again, having the chief sat with me through the process, assistant town manager, the HR director, at the arbitration hearing, we were standing by the, the 10 person minimum. The request on the table from the union was 19 person minimum. And then the arbitrator weighed all the considerations, including the town's limited resources, and came back with a ruling that said basically one apparatus at all times with, with three firefighters. And basically, the arbitrator reasoned, and if you read the text of the multi-page decision, that her rationale was, well, when the town wanted to fund a fire station, it did. Therefore, that's evidence that when the town wants to fund something, it will. So basically, the answer is, was no. There was no negotiations beyond that. We stood by the fact of the model of the town. I also had to stand by the bargaining direction that was given to me by the Board of Selectmen in terms of the total funding award. Uh, and also recognizing the limitations in the budget, as well as the fact that I have two other unions outstanding who are coming behind us in the arbitration process. So the short answer to your question is no. Um, we were at 10, they were at 19. The ruling came down with one apparatus at all times with three people, and there's no requirement on station configuration. And again, they could not issue an order regarding minimum manning. That's not allowed under state law. So the, the re reason they can do apparatus is that that's a safety consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Dave Hadley, Precinct 3. I'm just going to try to shoot for a quick clarification. Um, when we're talking about hiring more people and, and working, you know, ridiculous extra hours, uh, that, that's really not, I think, what we're, what we need to, it's not the way, the way it's being presented isn't exactly the way I'm seeing how you should understand it. Um, we work a 24-hour shift and then if people are out, they may not fill for the additional shifts depending on what we're going to drop down to. So um, back in the 80s, we had uh, the captain and five firefighters in the center station. Now we will run to, with the captain and two firefighters uh, if anybody is out. So if nobody's out sick or on vacation or, or bereavement or whatever, we could have the captain and five firefighters in the center station. But if people are on vacation, out sick, injured, bereavement, whatever, we can have the captain and two firefighters in the center station. 
So if we, if we change this system that we're talking right now, you know, when you're talking about the 19 people, obviously we're trying to get one more person on a truck at least to have a truck that has three, three firefighters on it. But a lot, of this, a lot of what we're talking about here is shifts that are not being filled um, because they're just, we're having uh, floaters or swingmen or whatever you want to call them so that they drop down from that maximum number to the captain and two firefighters. So the, the arbitration award that we won is giving us one engine with three firefighters on it, um, but now if that comes at the expense of closing a station, then we really didn't really win anything because we're going to end up with the exact same amount of firefighters, but a closed station and one engine with three firefighters. So it's not like it's not like every every time a firefighter is out there hiring, and somebody gets stuck working overtime and people are working 48 hours all the time. That that's not something that happens very often. But um, instead of not filling those shifts, they would have to fill one extra shift in order to give that third man on the engine. And we're hoping it doesn't come at the expense of closing a fire station. I hope that clarifies. Thank you. Thank you. Debbie Derry, Precinct 6. I recently had gone to pick up a sign on Natalie Road in South Chelmsford. And I bring this up because I hadn't toured that part of, of town for a while. Although I worked in Acton and always took Route 27. And I recall when we did close the South Station because I used to drive by it and it said the station was closed. I cannot imagine closing that station after I went to Natalie Road where those homes were not built previously. I had forgotten or was unaware of the area, how wooded it was. And not only that, I don't think the station should be closed. We have Hart Pond. We're dealing with a, a recreational area that's open to many. I think the money could be found somewhere. Maybe it could have came from the school budget, but we already passed it. Fire safety is one of the most important things that we could offer our residents and police. You know, I, I can't imagine standing outside my home, although I live in the center of town, and watching it burn because there's no one around to put out a fire. A couple of years ago, there was a fire of a car. I had someone with, we were driving to a meeting. We were gonna stop for dinner pri pri previous. We were on Chelmsford Street and all the traffic was stopped. There was a car that was on fire on Chelmsford Street coming off of 495 with the state police it was around 5.30 in the evening, quarter of six. There was no Chelmsford um, fire truck there. So because of the, we were all backed up, we drove and we went to the brick house and it was pouring. We went by the fire station and there, was, there were no fire trucks there. And they also, because they were busy, we drove back to go to the grill, and there still was no fire truck there. I have never seen a car on fire like I did on where, down the street from where I live, with no fire truck. And there was no fire truck, because the station was empty, and I don't know where those fire trucks were. So when I think about South Chelmsford, and what I had down the street from where I live in a busy area of a 495 with no fire truck. And I think of how far it is for our residents. I really am troubled. The money must be there someplace. And I really would appreciate it if you would keep this station open. Please support this amendment. Thank you. Hi, Mike Young, Precinct 9. I just kind of want to clarify something. I'm on the fire department as well, and I just want to say that the $245,000 additional that they're asking for may actually Please never speak be, in the microphone. I know may it's never actually be used, the $245,000. That's an estimate of overtime costs. Whether or not they actually spend that is up to whether people are sick 
injured or whatever. I mean, that's not a given number that's just going to be spent. It's a suggested amount that they may spend. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. That's all I had to add. Thank you. I, I would say it's more than a suggested amount because no, no, when, uh, I, when I go over the... Uh, I, Chief Ryan, if you're going to debate, okay. you have to get in line. Okay, I'm fine. sorry. <laughs> can, I, can I at least clarify where I get the numbers? There was no question before you. Maybe Jim could ask. Okay, okay that's fine. Let Jim ask. Jim I'm Blasey, sorry, but that's... Precinct two. Uh, Chief Ryan, I'd like to hear the response, please. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. So, these suggested numbers, I have to sit down with the finance team. We will, tr we will look back. We actually have actual numbers from fiscal 16, fiscal 17, and we have actual numbers up to April 10th of fiscal 18. So, it's to, you know, yes, we do have to project for next year. But I will sit down with the finance team, with the town accountant, and I think we're all kind of on the same page that the 245 is pretty spot on. Thank you. Thank you. Having heard that, I think we're the victim tonight of timing. The arbitration award came down, what, two and a half weeks ago? Just over a month ago. Just about a month ago, okay. Um, the budget is a process, and it's, it's a process that takes many months. Um, and it's reviewed by the Finance Committee starting in January and, and beginning of February. It's a long process. And by that time, the departments have all met with the finance team. They've met with Paul Cohen. He's put together his budget. And he's really developed something uh, based upon actual numbers, needs, requests. And there are a lot of requests that come to us that we review when we go out with our liaison assignments about items that need to be addressed that just can't be addressed because we don't have the capacity to address them. My concern is that we have multiple, multiple departments that need things, that want things, that desire things, and some of them are safety concerns. And if we address just one, while we have arbitration waiting on two other unions, if we start addressing needs just because it sounds like it's a safety concern, and it is a safety concern, I'm not, I'm not unsympathetic to the Light. My parents live down in South Chelmsford. They live very close to the fire station. My daughter's there multiple times a week. It's a concern. We have to look at this pragmatically. We can't just look at this as a, a fear, a, 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 a threat. We have to look at this and say, what can we actually accomplish? I'm, I'm heartened to hear that the response times by the police and the ambulance will not change. Um, we, we, we really need to look at this. And if we have to wait until the fall to look at this and say, where did free cash come in? What, what are we looking at as far as, as funds that have been returned and, and amend the budget at that time, which we do annually before it has been approved for the next fiscal year, then we do that. But my real concern tonight is we need to think with our heads, not with our hearts all the time. And if you give the mouse a cookie, they're going to ask for a glass of milk. Thank you. Paul Regazio, Precinct 7. I'd like to move the question, please. Well, there's, there's no one behind you, Mr. Regazio. So if you withdraw the motion, we can net, get to voting on the, R, the amendment itself. How's that? Right. I will remove the amendment. Thank, Thank you. you. Other, other OK. Thank you. So what we're going to be voting on now is um, Mr. Latina's uh, amendment to increase the, um, and, and we're not voting on the entire budget, we're only in, in voting on his amendment uh, to increase that one line item uh, by $245,000. So let's vote on that now. A yes vote is to increase the budget and a no vote is not to. And the amendment passes 105 in favor, 39 opposed, no abstentions.
<laughs> so now we're back to the original as amended budget. And we would be, unless people have discussion on other aspects of the original budget, uh, and we apparently have someone who does. We're on, uh, still on Article 6, right? We are still on Article 6 right. as amended. Mr. Moderator, to you, the town. Uh, uh, kindly, Mr. Beatty. I'm kindly. sorry, Kelly I Beatty, uh, 117 Park Road, Precinct 5. In the original uh, operating budget, I see there $68,000 and change from cable television license revenue to be put toward the uh, general operating budget. Mm -hmm. It's my understanding that with the establishment of the Enterprise Fund for Chelmsford Telemedia last year, mm -hmm. that all monies received mm -hmm. from our providers were to go into that uh, Enterprise Fund. Is this a change to that plan? No, it is not. And as you can see, there are other transfers from other self-contained funds, such as the sewer user revenue, the child care revolving fund. Basically, this reflects the fact that we, the benefit costs for those employees who are, pay, who are all paid for through the town's uh, health care budget. So there's no change in the telemedia receiving all the revenues. It's just that under the, we have the indirect costs that have to be reimbursed to the town for those employees in Chumps of Telemedia. And that's been the case last year. It'll be the case next year. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Davidson, Precinct 3. Uh, as of now, with the additional $245,000 to the operating budget, um, how, will that, how will that be funded? Well, I, I intend under, under the next article to reduce the reserve fund by $245,000 so that we at least have some sense of you know, completeness of the meeting tonight. As I said, we'll be back visiting this budget at a later time when we bring forth the two police arbitration awards that are coming down the road at us. And just to be clear, town meeting doesn't have the authority to either keep open or close a fire station. We've simply allocated money to a line item, correct? That is correct. So that decision falls to who? Is that your decision or the fire chiefs or, or who's? It, under Massachusetts general laws and the provisions accepted by Chelmsford, we have a strong fire chief. The fire chief is the sole person in charge of personnel and equipment and staffing and operations of his department. So that, that decision rests with the fire chief. Uh, however, I, you know, I would expect that the chief would respect the direction from the legislative body, um, but ultimately it is his call. And I assume when you were preparing the overall budget, you consulted with the fire chief as to here's how much money you're getting for the year, right? Yes, we had, we, as was discussed, described by the Finance Committee Chair, we had a budget development process that began last October and went through this April. Um, so yes, everyone understood, and we also knew that this, these, these unresolved labor agreements were out there, um, but obviously we didn't know the outcome until a month ago. So on the, on the next article that's coming up, and maybe I, I should table this till the next article that comes up, you'll, you'll probably have some concerns that that's going to be underfunded then, right? Well, I think as was noted by an earlier speaker this evening, it's certainly underfunded by historic uh, uses of the reserve fund during, during the year. Um, as we say, we don't know what will happen starting July 1, um, but we know that life will happen and we'll have to deal with it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. No more discussion, no more questions. Then let's vote on Article 6 as amended. A yes vote is to approve the amended budget. Interesting debate for sure concerning the uh, safety net in our town and what, it's, what it takes to maintain that safety net. Uh, those of you who've been here a long time recall that there was a time during the 1990s when we closed one of the fire stations, South Fire Station in fact, um, and, and also East. I think it was a, on a rotating basis. Uh, it was the article passed, great, 136 in favor, 6 opposed, no It was great abstention. celebration that we were able to finally refund those uh, the, the positions to keep all five of the stations open. And I think that the clear sentiment of town meeting is that it's a path we don't want to go back down. So it will, uh, it will require the town to 
fund another roughly $240,000, quarter of a million dollars, to keep all five stations open for the coming year while we try to sort out the best path forward, not only to keep them open, but also to keep the uh, budget solvent. ...year 2019, as provided in General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 6. Um, the um, requested amount of 155,000 is point. It's less. It's probably about point one three percent of our. Ex excuse me, Mr. Manager. Excuse me. Yeah. There actually hasn't been a motion to amend that. Is this a consensual? I, I, am, I am. I am inserting this as the amendment. Uh, okay. As the motion under this article. So, so it's a consensual. Yes. Okay. Thank you. One fifty-five. Okay. F excuse me. Go ahead. I, again, the, the, most, the request is $155,000. Again, what the reserve fund is, for, I know we have several new town meeting representatives here this evening. Um, the reserve fund is used by the finance committee outside of town meeting to fund for extraordinary or unforeseen expenditures. Um, this amount of $155,000 is probably 0.13% of the town's $132 million budget. Obviously, it's a lesser amount than what we've utilized in recent years. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Manager. All right, does the Finance Committee have a recommendation regarding the amended number? The Finance Committee has not had the opportunity to provide a recommendation. Thank you. Board of Selectmen? We have not had an opportunity to discuss 155 as opposed to the 400 this time. Thank you. Opportunity for questions and answers, discussion. Scott Davidson, Precinct 3. So why did you choose to remove $245,000 from this? I'm, I'm curious because up until five minutes ago, you thought that the number needed to be $400,000 and just simply because we've allocated it somewhere else, we don't need it here now? Through you, Mr. Moderator, because I'm trying to keep my eye on the ball. As I said repeatedly this evening, this isn't the end of the budget process for this year. I, I now have to go into Boston and deal with the two police unions as a result of the actions at tonight's meeting, and I know that those awards are coming. Now, yes, much like the fire union, we did set funds aside in the stabilization fund uh, to anticipate the prior years, but now, again, I don't have the problem going, I don't have the funds going forward to fund similar amount overall awards for those two groups. I think the idea of doing here is, is somewhat trying to keep the table level in terms of what was done this evening and then where we are going forward. But yes, the short answer is we're gonna revisit all of this in, at a fall town meeting or a special town meeting that comes earlier. And I think the disappointing part for me is, 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 is that we've gotta recognize the fact that we should have our recurring revenues meet our recurring costs. Otherwise we go into a spiral and really it's my job to ring the bell, so to speak, to alert everybody to that issue um, because we don't want to repeat what happened in this community in the mid-2000s where the stabilization fund was depleted, the town lost its bond rating, and the Department of Revenue was at our door saying, what's going on with the town of Chelmsford's finances? I, I agree with 100% with everything that you just said, and I'm disappointed that we've had to take $245,000 from this fund. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? There being none, we will vote on Article 7 as amended to appropriate $155,000 to the reserve fund, uh, to the uh, Finance C uh, Committee Discretionary Fund. Obviously, there are only so many dollars to work with, and uh, having just allocated an extra roughly quarter of a million dollars to public safety personnel funding, uh, we now have to reduce that amount somewhere else. And the easiest and obvious, most obvious way is this uh, uh, sort of rainy day fund that the Finance Committee uh, maintains for situations that arise during the year for which there's no other obvious funding source. This is coming very handy. The article passes 136 today. in favor, four uh, against, and two abstentions. But again, clearly the sentiment of the town meeting reps was that the, uh, the maintaining of the Apparently fire... Apparently there's no action on Article 8, paramount. so we will proceed to Article 9. 
Mr. Moderator, members of town meeting, Article 9 is the fiscal year 2019 capital budget. Uh, the requested appropriation is for $3,280,571. I'm now going to turn the podium over to John Souza, who's our finance director, who chairs the capital budget committee. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Good evening. Tonight, I'd like to provide you with an overview of our fiscal year 19 capital improvement plan. This first slide, uh, although this might be a little difficult to read, this can be found on page H3 of the large spiral bound budget book and also on page 63 of the Finance Committee report. And it details all of the projects contained in the plan. This next slide shows the uh, members of the Capital Planning Committee. Uh, we're pleased to have two citizens, Dennis Bach and John Morrison, as well as representatives from the Finance Committee, School Committee, and Board of Library Trustees. And we're also joined by our town accountant, Darlene Lucia. The Capital Planning Committee began holding public meetings back in November and reviewed a series of projects totaling $4.8 million. This slide shows a summary of the projects broken out by functional area. And you can see that the first four categories account for about 18% of the plan. Public works and public facilities account for about 30%. And finally, school facilities and school technology account for about 53%. The total of all the projects totals just over 3.28 million. And then just to look at the financing of how the plan will be funded, we'll be using 180,571 of recaptured funds. And for those of you that may be new to the process, what recaptured funds are is they're monies that are left over from prior year capital projects that have been completed under budget. So unexpended bond proceeds. And state law allows us to repurpose those funds and use them to defray the cost of the, this year's capital projects. So it, it allows us to borrow less in effect. The net amount that we would be bonding would be 3.1 million. And then we'll look at each of the project areas a little, little more detail. Uh, first is municipal technology, an a infrastructure upgrade which includes replacing racks, some end of life switches and wiring is proposed for a number of municipal buildings that you see on the slide at a cost of 90,000. Uh, the next two projects are being done uh, through cooperation between our police department and our IT department. And the goal is to extend um, fiber optic network and, and provide security cameras to um, three locations. It's Roberts Field, the McCarthy Turf Field, and the boat ramp at Southwell Park. And those two projects uh, you see are 59,000 and 30,000. Moving on to municipal administration, um, this is really part of a multi-year effort that's being led by our town clerk. And I wanted to point out that although we make every opportunity to take advantage of digital technology, we have a large amount of historical records and plans that must be maintained by our town clerk, the planning board, and other departments to be kept in perpetuity, which means obviously we, we don't have the luxury of just keeping these records for a short time and then moving them or disposing them. They have to be kept forever. So the goals of this plan is to preserve the aging records that you see a photo on the left-hand side, and then to um, install climate controls to, to extend the life of these records, and also to involve install movable shelving that you see in the last photo so that we can make better use of the space that we have at the town office building. The cost of that is 115,000. Moving on to our public library, uh, many of us still think of the Adams Library edition as new. In reality, it was constructed during the late 90s, and because of the heavy foot traffic and amount of visitors, the carpet is completely worn out. And this is the first phase of carpet replacement, is funded at 50,000. Next project is in public safety, and I should point out this was necessitated by the um, fact that Verizon informed the community that we'll be discontinuing a number of copper lines in town. And so this is a cooperative effort between the fire chief, police chief, and our IT staff. And the best proposed outcome was to um, upgrade the system to microwave technology. And um, after studying it, 
looking at different options, this is really the most cost-effective and reliable solution. It's going to greatly enhance police and fire radio communications. And the cost of that is 235000 Next, in public works, there are three infrastructure uh, projects planned. A continuation of the sidewalk construction program for 325000 more road improvements that are based on the pavement engineering survey that was completed a number of years back. The roadway improvements will total 325000 And then finally, some drainage improvements, which includes um, repairs on catch basins, manholes, and other structures to prevent flooding. And in the interest of time, I won't read through all the um, locations for those, but those are contained on your slide. Moving on to municipal facilities, the first project uh, the building that we're all gathered in tonight, the Senior Center, opened in the late 80s, and believe it or not, the roof is original. Uh, so the, the cost to replace it, it's at the end of its useful life, is 110000 A specialized piece of equipment for municipal facilities. Um, key point to um, understand on this one is this is going to replace an um, older sidewalk snowblower machine uh, from the late 80s. This unique piece of equipment is a combination, can be used for multi-purposes. It's a wide area mower. So this is going to allow the school facilities staff to, uh, the municipal facilities staff to mow the athletic fields at least three times faster, boosting productivity. The good thing about this piece of equipment is in the winter season, the mowing decks can be removed and a snowblower attachment will be put on and it will be used as a, to remove snow from the sidewalk. So it will be used in many seasons. Moving on to school facilities, the first project involves, the Chum, involves Chumsford High School, and this is a complete repaving of the um, rear lot. And you see three photos that I have here on the slide. The first photo shows the condition um, of the area in the rear lot adjacent to Alumni Field. Uh, where you enter to view to go in for a, a sporting event. You can see the, the disrepair of the parking lot. The, um, the middle photo shows the road that leads into the uh, parking area for students and staff. And then finally, the third photo shows the condition of the concrete sidewalk as you enter the Performing Arts Center. Chumsford High opened in 74, and although the Performing Arts Center was added on later, you can see this is really the first time that, although the parking lot has been re Repairs have been done over the years, but this is the first effort to ever completely repave and reconstruct that. And that's at a cost of $1,062,000. The second school facilities project involves Parker Middle School. And this project for 190000 includes the complete repaving of the front area of the lot, sidewalks and curbs. Parker Middle School opened in the mid-60s, and this is the only, only the second time in the school's history that we're aware of that a complete repaving has ever been done. You can see a picture near the main entrance, and the need is there. As you can see, it's the cracks and other things are becoming uh, a safety hazard at this point. And then the last area is school technology. Uh, the first project on the list is a network infrastructure upgrade for three schools, McCarthy Middle School, Harrington Elementary, and Center Elementary at a cost of 376000 And this is going to greatly en enhance the switching and Wi-Fi capabilities at those schools. The next project is the inter interactive classroom technology. Uh, this is something you've seen before. This is actually the 11th phase. And what this does, as you know from past years, is this is an effort to install either interactive whiteboards or large panel video display monitors in classrooms. One minute, Mr. Souza. Thank you. And then the final project is a security camera upgrade that's planned for, at various school locations at a cost of 45000 And then finally, it, just the, the capital budget process, uh, following town meeting consideration tonight, the next step is um, in June, the town would then issue municipal bonds to finance the program. That concludes my presentation, and if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Souza. Uh, does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 9. Does the uh, Board of Selectmen have a recommendation? 
Board of Selectmen universally uh, recommends approval of Article 9. Are there any questions, discussions? Sue Carter, Precinct 5. Um, I would just like to thank the uh, committee for coming up with all these numbers. But I have a question, well, or a comment, I guess, so you can start the clock. Um, if we're concerned about closing public safety buildings, do we really need a lawnmower that is three times faster? I would love one too, but it's not in my own personal budget. I mean, I know we borrow for these items. So are we, can some of these be delayed till we know more of what's going on with the police and fire negotiations in arbitration? Um, and we talked about there's the school facility study being done where you're talking about we may need to rebuild and do stuff to the different schools. Why are we paying over a million dollars to redo a parking lot that may get dug up down in a few years when we do an addition or change something at the high school? Okay. Can we hold some of these things off until we know more about what's happening with the operating budget and not pay it every year towards Ms. the Ms. Carter. Can you ask one oh, question right, at a sorry. time? Because you've asked about sorry. seven. No, no. So I guess my question is, is um, I understand that we pay for capital projects through bonds, which comes out of our operating budget to pay the debt. So my question is, is this money better spent on our operating budget than paying the debt on some of these things that may or may not be necessary? Can you address that? Through you, Mr. Moderator. I think the answer is I would not advise that. I mean, think about it. We, we, we're talking about a $132 million operating budget, and we're devoting $3 million to capital. You can see the percentages are, are probably we're underfunding capital. If you look in the book that the finance director spoke to you about, you can see the backlog of projects that, that are going forward in years out. We defer items because we, we're trying to stay within this $3 million number. Um, to answer about the high school parking lot, I'm not aware of any school construction plan that deals with any construction or any excavation in the existing high school parking lot area. The problem with that high school parking lot is it is a safety issue. That is the original surface that was put in back in 1974, and right now it's, it's moonscape out there. It is dangerous. It is a fall and trip hazard. It's a liability to the town if somebody gets injured out there because it's a known defect. With respect to the sidewalk plow, yes, it is, it, is, it is important to, again, utilize with the most efficient productivity that we can have. But more importantly, forgetting about the cutting of the mowing of the grass with multiple mowers, we know that in the wintertime, we don't have adequate sidewalk plows to get the sidewalks cleared when the kids want to go back to school in the next day or two after the storm has come. It is taking us, and we've heard from the public direct, works director repeatedly at selectman meetings and so forth, with the amount of equipment that we have and the staffing that we have, it takes us a four-day cycle to clear the sidewalks in an acceptable manner across the community. That is therefore also another safety consideration. So I can assure you, the, the speaker, as well as the town meeting body, we take these considerations very seriously and we only bring forth what we believe is to be essential. And you can see the common theme through all of this is public safety. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Beth Logan, Precinct 3. Um, you started to touch upon my question, which is um, what it, it would be great if in future years, like next April, you showed us the capital budget compared to the last couple years and just let us know how much it's gone up or down each year. And if you have any of that information, that would be handy. Thank you. Thank you. That was a question there. If you have it, please share with us. Yeah, it's been, I would say at least for about s at least seven years, it's been in a range of between three to 3.3 .3 million pretty consistently. Okay, so you're saying there's been, while there's been an increase to almost every section of the budget, this area has not increased year over year for probably seven years. Yes. Okay, thank you. Brian Latina, Precinct 4. Um, Mr. Moderator, through you to the speaker. Um, when my kids were in high school, we paid parking fees. I imagine those have gone away now. 
Oh, they're still there. Why would, why would those parking fees not go against the maintenance of the parking lot that the car fee is paying for? Well, the superintendent can, can speak to this, but I can assure you, just much like the bus fee, it doesn't cover the full cost of operations. But I'll have the superintendent speak to the use of those revenues. Thank you. The use of, um, we do still charge a bus fee for students to uh, ride a school bus to school. And high school students at the high school typically start out on a bus and then, you know, their sophomore, junior year transition over to having a car. Um, they can turn their bus pass in and just pay the differential for a parking pass at the high school. The funds from both, whether it's a bus pass or the parking pass at the high school, go into the, uh, basically the transportation uh, revolving fund. And that is an offset to our transportation cost. So in our uh, budget, we actually have a line item where there's an offset for all of those fees that come in through bus passes and students at the high school who pay a, um, uh, for the pass to park at the high school goes into the transportation revolving fund and then it is used as an offset to the budget. And, and um, Ms. Moderator, through you to the speaker, my understanding is state statute requires that a fee go against the actual cost associated to the thing that you're paying the fee for. Mm -hmm. Revolving fund for transportation for somebody that is parking, it's not transportation, it's parking. Yes, we've always considered it part of transportation because again, oftentimes if you even look at, you'd have to look at the revenue split. I don't have it off the top of my head, but we take in approximately $430,000 a year for these fees. A very minor amount of those fees is for the high school parking because again, you're only talking the upperclassmen at the high school and most of them actually purchase the bus pass to begin with to start the year. And then they kind of, they've already paid for the bus pass they just trade the bus pass in for the uh, parking fee. We don't then go and kind of credit them for the bus pass and, and charge them to park at the high school. It just it goes as a wash right through that fund and it is an offset to our budget. So the, the, the parking fee itself is not accounted for um, the way we were told at town meeting when it was first invoked, which was it was to pay for the security officer in the parking lot, as I recall. I assume that transitioned over time. And the bus fee was to pay for the administrator for the, um, for the kids that were, were not within the, the, uh, the range. They were within a mile or two of school. It was to pay for that administrator. That's what town meeting was told when they were first invoked. So okay. I assumed that it transitioned. Second part of the question I have for you is. Well, let him answer the first part first. Okay. Yeah, you asked two parts. I'm going to forget okay. before you get on to the rest. I, I was not here. I have no idea um, what you originally told or whatnot. I can tell you how it's currently being used. Um, to the, again, to the first part, it's going as a direct offset to our, our account. When it comes to the uh, bus pass, which I think was your, your second piece, it's going to basically as an offset to the transportation contract. Um, within the school department's budget, there's a whole page for transportation, and you have a, um, a line item for, say, the transportation supervisor, and you have uh, costs associated with our contracted transportation providers, and it's an offset to that page. Um, so we typically, just because the biggest number on the page is the transportation contract for the bus company, would offset it to that. But it is definitely going as an offset to transportation services for the schools. Okay. Could, could we have a, a legal opinion, not now, but looking forward to see if that fee is properly being accounted for because I don't believe it is in, in what we were told back when it was first invoked. Um, second part of my question is how much did we generate with parking fees at the high school? And, and I'll hedge a little bit when my kids paid the parking fee. Yeah, uh, Mr. Mr. Latina, yes. I've, I've given you some leeway, but this is the capital budget. This is not a parking fee budget. This is for, for capital expenditures for, for repairs to a parking lot. And, and to the extent that your, your questions address that, I have no problem, but I don't want us to go afield on, okay. on Mr. parking Mr. Moderator, you can start the clock. This is actually a little bit of rhetoric, if you would. Um, the parking fee is related to parking. When my kids were in the school system, the bus fee, you either paid both or you couldn't get on the bus when the snowstorm hit. So we would have to drive the kids when it was dangerous. And I always had a problem with that. I had to pay 400 bucks for my kids for the bus fee and the parking fee. And it, I'm glad to hear that you've adjusted that. However, I think that the logic of that um, goes a little bit beyond what the intention of a fee is. It sounds more like what you're describing is a tax to offset some general fund that we, we would like to offset. 
what I'd like town meeting to know is exactly what the parking fees have generated while they've been sitting in that parking lot, those kids' cars, and there's towing that happens as well when you don't have the sticker. I know of several cars that were towed as a, as a process to get the kids to pay their parking fees. So if we could get that figure, that would be very helpful so that I could understand that. Okay, Mr. Latina, you, you've made your point on the parking fees. The, no, you're, you're really I'm, going I'm afar in your, in your debate. The debate is capital funding for repairs to or buying equipment. The, the is, stay, stay focused on that, sir. The debate is regarding $1 million to be borrowed for the next 10 years, 20 years, Mr. Finance Manager. How long are we going to borrow a million dollars? We need to borrow a million dollars. We're going to, to we're it. planning to borrow f over a 10 year term for the parking lot. Okay. And what would the total cost really be? Not a million. Interest rate is 4% right now. It's hard. To, I mean, it's hard to give you an exact number. I mean, uh, I would assume it would probably be about three and a half to 4% interest. Uh, but that's true of any capital project. You would have interest on that. It just, town meeting needs to understand that we're borrowing for 10 years to pave the parking lot. And I went to UMass Lowell and parked in a dirt lot for four years. It wasn't a problem. And if, it, if that parking lot is unsafe, as you said, we have a more serious problem because the DPW needs to make sure that our parking lots and our streets are safe, that those potholes are filled in rather than building granite curbs. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Davidson, Precinct 3. With regards to the, uh, the parking lot at Chelmsford High, uh, will, will that also address the lighting for the parking lot? Because I think that's a safety issue as well. The, the lighting at night is quite, quite poor, so. No. It doesn't? It will, I will, I will defer to our director of facilities, but I believe it's solely for the curbing, the sidewalks, and the pavement. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? There being none, we will vote on uh, the capital budget. This requires a two-thirds vote. Paul Cohen made an interesting point about uh, in a and while you're waiting, I've been informed that the Celtics have won and the Bruins have lost. So just, just for those of you who care. In a, uh, with a hundred, roughly $130 million operating budget and a $3 million capital budget, uh, the capital budget always seems to draw a disproportionate amount of scrutiny on the part of town meeting members who object. And the uh, article passes 128 in favor. 10 opposed, zero abstentions. But in this case, it seems Thank to have you, passed. Mr. Moderator, the next article is rather brief. It's Article 11. We did 10 with the Sewer Enterprise Fund as a consent agenda. Article 11 is for a sewer pump station upgrades. The request is $180,000 from the Sewer Enterprise Fund free cash to fund the upgrades to the Milan Avenue and Western Avenue sewer pump stations, weather tight buildings and pumps. Um, the the uh, goal here is, is obviously to, the, the fact that we have the townwide sewer and it's considered relatively new, although it's been over a half dozen years now since we finished the last phase of it, we're, we're really having to revisit as we have at previous town meetings portions of the sewer pumps uh, of the sewer system to keep it operational. And again, this doesn't come from the levy, it comes from the sewer fees. And this would be, again, the upgrades of those sewer pump stations with weather tight buildings and pumps. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 11. Does the uh, Board of Selectmen have a recommendation? Board of Selectmen unanimously recommends approval of Article 11. Any questions, concerns, discussion? There being none, we will vote on Article 11 to transfer $180,000 from the Sewer Enterprise Fund uh, free cash to upgrade the uh, Milan Ave and Western Avenue sewer pump stations.
The article passes 123 in favor, three opposed, zero abstentions. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Article 12 is another brief article. This is the establishment of a new enterprise fund. And the reason for this article to establish a new enterprise fund and to appropriate funds for the upcoming year is that in the last few months, the town is, in accordance with the appropriation and authorization by this town meeting body, has acquired ownership in the Chelmsford Forum facility. And now that we now have ownership, the legislation and funding provisions that were part of the special act for the last 20 years have gone away. We now again, much like we did with the golf course, the sewer, and so forth, uh, we're setting up an enterprise fund. So therefore, the total revenues from the forum's operations would go solely and exclusively to fund the ongoing operations and maintenance of the forum. So the first part of the motion of Article A is to establish the sewer enterprise fund effective at the beginning of this upcoming fiscal year, 2019. And then the second component is to appropriate $110,000 in expenses to operate the sewer enterprise fund for the fisc upcoming fiscal year. And that $110,000 comes from the enterprise fund revenues, which is a long-winded way of saying the lease payment that we have received from the competitively bid operations of the forum will go to pay the operations and maintenance of the facility. And then once again, we'll report annually on the operations of the forum. Uh, we now have a five-year contract with a new provider going forward. And so again, this establishes an exclusive accounting mechanism for the the town's newly owned Chelmsford Forum. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 12. Does the Board of Selectmen have a recommendation? Board of Selectmen un unanimously recommends approval of Article 12. Is there any discussion or questions? Precinct 6. Paul, can you just review for me how we're paying the bond back that we use to buy the form? Is it coming that, out? That, that's, this article covers that as that, well. That's, that's, in, that's, the, that's in the 110,000. That's in the 110,000, exactly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? There to be, appear to be none. We will now uh, vote on uh, Article uh, 12 uh, to appropriate funds for a uh, Chelmsford Forum Enterprise Fund, the amount of $110,000. It was actually a day of some celebration when we finally got control of the Chelmsford Forum, having uh, leased it uh, from the state for quite some time. It's, um, it's something of, a, of a, a, a plum property, if you like ice, and ice skating and hockey. And so this is the next logical step in the maintenance and long-term care of that. These enterprise funds, as you've seen tonight, have become uh, useful tools. Uh, prior to that, there were a handful of what were known as revolving funds, uh, but, but uh, this is uh, now a state sort of uh, the article empowered passes 130 way to in favor, one opposed, one abstention. create these sort of closed part this evening. The next one is Article 16. Uh, it's the establishment of a new revolving fund. Um, and this has to do with cemetery wreaths and floral decorations. And again, if this is established this evening, it would go into our bylaws and then it would be on the list with the others next year. Many of you may recall that the cemetery uh, did a uh, wreaths for veterans program that was quite successful during uh, the last holiday season. And even before the genesis of that, the cemetery director was looking for a means where he could accommodate um, people uh, who utilize the cemetery um, uh, services uh, in, in terms of providing floral arrangements and wreaths and other stuff for holiday and other occasions. And what this article would do, would, it would be establish a cemetery wreath slash floral decoration revolving fund, and therefore any revenues for those who wish to have those services provided by the cemetery department um, could, could make those funds available to the cemetery department, they would then carry out those provisions. It's particularly handy for people who live perhaps some distance away from the community. And again, the balance of such funds during the fiscal year would not exceed $10,000. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. How does the fi uh, Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 16. Board of Selectmen have a recommendation. Board of Selectmen unanimously recommends approval of Article 16. Any questions or comments regarding this article? 
There appear to be none. We will now vote on Article 16, which is the Cemetery Wreath Floral Decorations Revolving Fund, an amount not to exceed $10,000. Yes, as I was saying at the end of the last article, uh, prior to these enterprise funds, revolving funds such as this one were uh, used occasionally for you know the uh, community uh, recreation department and such. A couple few years ago, the state uh, authorized a more robust method, these enterprise funds, which are kind of closed box systems. Money goes in, it can only be used for that purpose, uh, can't be used for any other purpose, and, uh, and, and it rolls over from year to year. So you're seeing more and more of these in the town budget for certain uh, specific uh, activities that the have income and expenses only for that. Two opposed, no abstentions. Thank you, Ms. Mutter. I think the final article we can take up and briefly this evening is Article 19. Again, following our order, we've taken action now through the first 18 articles. Article 19 is a straightforward article. It's rescinding unissued borrowing regarding the completed school module classroom project. You may recall at the um, 2016 fall annual town meeting, $7.9 million was authorized uh, for borrowing to undertake that project. Uh, basically, as was indicated uh, at that time, the project came in a uh, million dollars under budget, uh, under the appropriation. However, we really need to take this vote to get that borrowing authorization off of the town books, because otherwise it stands out there in our financial liabilities as an as a authorized but an issued debt. Um, which, and so basically the action here is to rescind that borrowing um, as the motion that's been provided by bond council. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Finance Committee have a recommendation. The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 19. Board of Selectmen have a recommendation. Board of Selectmen unanimously recommends approval of Article 19. Any questions or concerns regarding Article 19? There appearing to be none, we will vote on Article 19. Eventually. The article passes uh, 126 in favor, no opposition, one abstention. I'll entertain a motion to uh, reconvene on Thursday, May 3rd. 7.30 here. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. And so we got through 19 of the 31 articles on this uh, spring town meeting warrant. It's actually farther along than I would have guessed. I would have thought that the issue involving the closing of the fire stations would have been a lot more protracted in discussion. As it turns out, Brian Latina offered an amendment to increase the, uh, the uh, basically the public safety personnel budget by about $244,000. That's the amount that Chief Ryan estimated would be needed to, main, to, to satisfy the notion of a third uh, firefighter at one of the stations as was uh, recommended by the arbitrator during the uh, collective bargaining agreement. So uh, that ended up being pretty unanimously, unanimously favored by town meeting reps. In fact, in a seismic shift, uh, I, we saw Glenn Thorne and Brian Latina agreeing on uh, that amendment and uh, perhaps that paved the way for a faster approval. In any case, we have uh, most of the heavy lifting done on this town meeting warrant. We have, uh, starting next Thursday, we'll deal with community preservation, uh, uh, the Conservation Preservation Committee activities, and, and uh, that's always an interesting but often time-consuming part of the spring town meeting budget. And then later on, there'll be, uh, among other things, three citizen petition, petitions 
either uh, sponsored or co-sponsored by Brian Latina, and uh, those have a, a range of, acti of uh, in, uh, topics, including conflict of interest in involving town meeting representatives. I'm sure it'll be interesting. I hope you'll join us on Thursday night, 7.30, here at the Senior Center as we continue our spring town meeting. A big thanks to all of our volunteers and staff of Chelmsford Telemedia, whose budget was approved tonight, uh, who bring you these proceedings, and uh, we do our best to, to bring them to you in the best way possible. So thanks for that. Thanks for watching. See you on Thursday.